Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Um, so this will be super casual um, because we have a really small uh, crowd with us today. Um, so we have a PowerPoint that we're going to go through, um, but please interrupt us at any point if you have any questions. If you don't want to interrupt us and you want to put it in the uh, chat box, please ask any questions there. Um, and Reed will be watching those questions for us. Um, but thank you for joining us. I guess I should say who I am. I am Sarah Stobal. I'm the principal at Morrillton Intermediate School in the South Conway County School District. Um, we are a co we were a cohort one school with the PLC project. We were the very first group that, to go through the training. We have been super blessed with um, the best coaches from Solution Tree holding our hand and guiding us along the way. And so we think it's only right that we are offering our services to um, other schools. So this is our sixth grade team. Um, we have Steve Campbell. He teaches math and science. Jessica Franklin uh, teaches math and science as well. And she is a member of our guiding coalition. Jesse Moore will be the literacy piece. She was a literacy teacher for our sixth grade team and she is moving into the instructional facilitator role for us. Shania Hunter is math and science as well. Um, and she is a rock star first year teacher. So, um, Steve, Jessica, and Jesse started the playbook with us um, last year, and we're going to look at that website, but Shania has been very much a part of this work, so she's joining the team, and then Reed Fogelman is coming, is joining us from Paragold, is that correct? Paragold. Um, she is going to offer the ESL piece of this and look at some ways um, to modify your work to make sure that we're reaching all students. So anyway, like I said, we are part of the cohort training that went through year one. Um, because of the hard work of the awesome teachers in our building, we are also recognized at a, as a model PLC school. So I only tell you that so you will know who's meeting with you today, so you'll know if you should trust our work or not. Um, in order to become a model PLC school, you have to really prove what you're doing and have the data to back it up. So um, anyway, let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to share the screen, but oh, well, look, I've already messed up. Um, I want to know who is here with us today. So I know I'm assuming you're sixth grade teachers, but can you tell us where you're joining us from and where you are in the PLC process? Candice, do you mind to start? Uh, I'm from McCrory, Arkansas. It's a rural school district, high poverty Title I school district. I'm a reading interventionist. Uh, I get paid through Title I funds. Okay. And I don't actually teach sixth grade yet or have, I just take in information and prepare for students who are sixth graders. I get them at the seventh grade level through eighth okay. grade. And then I'd also give interventions through ninth through 12th grade for students who have characteristics of dyslexia. Okay. Um, I have my, my degree, I have an MED, I'm a reading specialist and dyslexia therapist. And I'm uh, in the, this, this semester, I'm gonna go uh, through the Tate Flight program and uh, through yeah. the Luke to get my count in two years. Okay, awesome. And then Olivia? I'm Olivia Peeler. I'm from Jonesboro. I work at one of Jonesboro schools, a uh, magnet called Micro Society. It's a very high poverty school. Um, this is my first year teaching sixth grade. I've been teaching fifth grade for two years and I'm looping um, with my fifth graders into sixth grade. Okay. Um, so I'm super excited, but I'm also going to be the grade level chair. So I'm going to be the guiding coalition. I'm in charge of RTI. I'm in charge of PLCs. So I'm really excited to learn because the problem is, is the way it's set up is our third, our fourth, fifth, and sixth, every teacher is like a singleton. There's okay. not, I don't have, we don't have team. Our team, like, I guess, like a uh, subject team, content team is fifth is like vertical okay. uh, aligning. So, yeah. Okay. Well, welcome to sixth grade. <laughs> 
And then uh, I think we have one more person. Oh, there are more people joining. Okay, um, they've got their cameras off, so they probably don't wanna to talk to me right now and that's fine. So we will go ahead and get started. We are also a Title I school. So we, will, so we serve uh, similar populations as you do. So we've got that same background with our kiddos. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, so how we've got this set up, guys, is that we're going to start our morning. Um, Jesse, I just noticed my computer's not plugged in. And I will make that happen. I say that to Jesse because we were on a webinar together and I thought my computer was plugged in and it wasn't and it died and I left her with the state of Arkansas for the next 30 minutes. To people. In her room. <laughs> okay, so let me get to our... y'all see my screen I'm assuming I'm hoping okay so um let's go ahead and get started again we're going to spend the majority of our time the goal is to um help you have a better understanding and a firmer grasp of what the PLC process is however you are clearly joining because you also teach sixth grade and you want to know a little bit about that so again we're casual we want this to be the best for you so interrupt us at any point and say i have no idea what you're talking about can you give me a little bit more information or um this sixth grade team they are like the masters of google docs and sheets and all the templates you could ever want so um i'm sure they have things that they can share all right, so I already went over this. It's to gain a better understanding of the work of a PLC and to work with practitioners to collaborate for sixth grade uh, students at curriculum. So when you think about, um, I'm not gonna do all the talking, so you're gonna actually get to hear from them, but I'm gonna get us started. Um, and team that's on here, if I'm stepping on your toes and getting into your information, please say stop, that's my work. Um, okay, so the three big ideas of a PLC and the four critical questions. I'm not sure where you are in the in the PLC process, so some of this may be an overview for you. Um, but everything we do, everything we do is focused on these three big ideas, a focus on learning, a collaborative culture and collective responsibility, and very results oriented. If you don't have the data for it, what are you doing it for? Okay, and then the four critical questions, what do we want our students to learn? How will, we, how will we know if they have learned it? What will we do if they didn't learn it? And what will we do if they have learned it? So um, when you think about the, those four questions, um, the first one, what do we want our students to learn? That will be that breaking down the essential standards, your targets, all of those big pieces. Um, and we will walk you through that process. How do we know if they've learned it? That is assessment design. I spent yesterday in Pine Bluff uh, presenting specifically on assessments. So if you want more information on that, if you don't think that we're giving you enough on that and about assessment design, let us know. We'll get into that work too. How, what will we do if they didn't learn it? That's our intervention our RTI process. At MIS, we look at the RTI process as an academic side and a behavior side, because if the, the we all know this about our students, you gotta teach certain behaviors for them to ever get to the academic side. And then what will we do if they have learned it? That is that extension piece, which full transparency, uh, that question four, we are still working on that. That's a tough question to answer. Um, especially when you've got the data in front of you for all of the students that you need to intervene with. Getting to that question four, sometimes that's that's the piece that we ourselves know that we need to work on. Okay, so the, the big pieces of the um, PLC process will be the vision, the mission, the CCs, collective commitments, here it's values, and goals. So at Moralton Intermediate School, our why, why do we exist, is to maximize the safety, learning, and achievement of every scholar today. We've got a pretty firm grasp on our mission. Um, if you've not done work around mission, um, you've got to start there. Because if you are working with the staff that doesn't share a common purpose, you're not ever going to really truly get to that collaborative piece. 
You've got to know what it is that you are working for. What is your purpose? Um, we, in order to keep that at the forefront of everything that we do, our mission is on the top of every one of our unit plans. It's more than just posted in our hallway. We often say it's not just our mission, we're on a mission just to keep that alive for us. The vision, what must our school become to accomplish our purpose? That is your North Star and we know that. Where is it that you're trying to go? For us, we want to be a beacon of hope uh, for our community. Um, that is, that is part of our vision statement that we want our school to be the center of our community. And it hasn't always been, um, but just that this is the place that provides hope for all of our students. It is your compelling future. Like I said, it is your North Star. What is it that you are working toward? When we, um, Jessica, when was that? Last year or the year before that we had done a lot of work around the vision? I think it was two years ago. Yeah, I think it was the year before. Okay, I think it was the year before. Um, as a district, we we were gathering to rewrite our vision statement because we did not have a clear vision statement. Um, and I'm a former English teacher and I want everything to sound beautiful. And so I was trying to come up with these big flowery words for what it was. What was our vision going to be? What would look good plaster on the walls? And that's the wrong approach to take. So the process that we followed for our vision was we just came together and we literally started with that question. What must our school become to accomplish our purpose? What is it that we are wanting to do? And we just started with phrases, just things that we wanted to accomplish with our, um, with our teams. And then it went from our teams to our guiding coalition to our school. Now, if you are sitting here thinking, I, we have a vision statement at our school and I'm just trying to worry about how to strengthen our team. I think it's really good practice to just even think about your vision for your team. What is it that you're wanting to accomplish within your team? What is your compelling future for your sixth grade team? Um, and then the next piece, the collective commitments. So the vision and mission are big. They can be district or school-wide. And then those collective commitments, we're bringing them down into your team. The collective commitments are huge. Please hear me now. Don't make the mistake that we did and skip over them. Um, I, to be honest, I think the first thing that I did when I heard that we needed collective commitments was I went to uh, Josh Ray's, another principal, and we both laughed about this. We went to Mason Crest Elementary, which is the school where Brian Butler is, and he's like, I don't know, they've won all these awards, and we're like, oh, they've got collective commitments, let's steal theirs. Well, that was obviously not the thing to do. <laughs> we needed to write them for our own school. So when you think about a collective commitment, you have to really think about how must you behave and that is exactly how you have to approach it. How must you behave to achieve your vision and your mission? And that's and so you are going to, as your team gets together, if our mission is to maximize the safety, learning and achievement of every scholar today, how must we behave to get to that mission? If you, I thought I had one handy, um, but it is actually propping up my computer right now. Um, if you look in Learning by Doing, which if you don't have that book, or there it is, if you haven't really gotten into that book, that needs to be your first stop on this journey. But our team spent some time together um, as a guiding coalition, and then this summer, we are spending some time together as our team to write out these collective commitments. And I just wanna to talk to you briefly about the process that we follow for that because it is really good work. It's a way when you think about collective commitments, it's not, necess it's not a set of rules. Just saying these are the rules doesn't sound as strong as these are commitments that we've made to each other. So when you think about the collective commitments and how you wanna behave, some of the things that our teams came up with were just, we, how they want to have discussion in their classroom, um, how they want to increase vocabulary within their classrooms. And so how must we behave for those things? So what we did is with each team, we just wrote down the behaviors that we wanted on, that we wanted to see 
um, on post-it notes and we gathered those and we divided them up according to literacy and then math and then school-wide. At Moralton Intermediate School, we have three behaviors that we talk about all the time with our kids, be ready, respectful, and responsible. So for the collective commitments, these are for the adults. What does it mean as an adult to be ready every day, responsible every day with the student's education and respectful every day? We had a lot of conversation just around what does it look like to create a respectful classroom? So I encourage you if, I don't know where you are in the process, but I encourage you um, this summer, or if you don't have time this summer, um, at least before school starts to get into learning by doing and really look at the sections on collective commitments. And I don't, because we've got a jam pack today, I'm not going to really flesh that out. We spent three hours doing the work and y'all don't wanna hear me talk about collective commitments for three hours, but I would really, really encourage you to start with your teens with those collective commitments if you haven't done those. So, um, and once you write those collective commitments, once you really agree to the behavior that you want for your school, you don't just tuck those away. Those become part of what you do. It's how you're going to hold each other accountable. If we're committed to this behavior, if we are committed to that we are going to have um, discussions around instructional strategies during our collaborative team time, and we're not doing that, you got to hold each other accountable on that. So uh, one way that we hold each other accountable school-wide is that we will just every nine weeks or at least once a semester, um, we'll get back together as a guiding coalition and or a whole school and just roll through those. Um, last year, we pulled up our collective commitments in January and we had some things really to celebrate. And we had some things that we uh, had forgotten about oh gosh, I, I forgot that we had actually put that on there as part of the work that we needed to do. So you know what, that second semester, whenever we made our um, goals for the year, that collective commitment moved back to the top. Um, so anyway, that's it's really, really good work for your team around those commitments. But remember, it's all based on behavior. If you are, if you are, writing a commitment that says that you want to increase the amount of time that you're reading in the class will increase as a goal that's something measurable how will you behave to increase the amount of reading that's happening um I don't, in, in a science class i'm just kind of making that up so what is the behavior around that that you are going to be strategic in how you are teaching students to do close reading that's a commitment that you're going to make then if you've made that commitment, it should appear in your unit plans because that's what you're committed to doing. I think the best thing um, that I read in the section about collective commitments is that, um, again, it's not a set of rules that really shows how everyone's going to operate, but it's more of like you have a, a moral obligation to hold each other accountable to these collective commitments. It's very powerful work. And then the last part is how in the world will you know if anything that you're doing is working and is it worth it? Those are your goals that you set. How will you mark your progress? Targets and timelines. I think it's super important to set yourself a timeline that doesn't say by the end of the year. Um, just like we set targets for our students, we have to do the same things with these goals for us. By October, this is what we want to accomplish. By Christmas, this is what we want to accomplish. And then you set those goals for you. Um, if you are, if you have, one of our collective commitments were, um, we had sent home a survey for our uh, parents to take. And one of the things that came out were how we communicate. We are a four, five, six building. We have some parents um, that expect us to continue to communicate the same way that the uh, lower elementary did. They want those daily reminders sent home to them. We have some parents that, you know, they think, oh, my kid's growing up, they should be more responsible. So we have kind of both sides of that communication, but we wrote a collective commitment around that we will, um, how we're communicating with our parents, and I don't have it right in front of me, and sharing resources with our parents. So let's go with that one. We wanted to share resources uh, with our parents um, around reading, around study skills, all of those things. So the progress for that is that we're going to set ourselves a timeline. 
By September, these are the resources we're gonna share with our parents. By October, these are the resources that we're gonna share. And then um, we can measure that by how much communication we're getting back from the parents, things like that. So anyway, um, I've probably talked about this longer than I was supposed to, but um, for um, Olivia, I believe, who's going to be the team lead, um, it's going to be really good work for you to start with those collective commitments. And again, if you will dig out your, or hopefully you don't have to dig it out, hopefully you have it nearby, a learning by doing book. The section on collective commitments, the work that we did as a team, we read that section together. We just reflected on what we read and then we just got started. It's great work. Okay, so let's talk for a second about, um, this is still me, right team? I haven't stepped on anyone's toes. Okay, still me. Um, I can only see Shania on my screen. So Shania, you tell me when I need to stop talking. <laughs> Okay, guiding coalition and collaborative teams. Um, I, I know we don't have any uh, principles on here, but just speaking from my point of view and the mistakes that I made, uh, when I first came here, I thought it was my job to do it all. Teachers need to go to their rooms and teach and I'm supposed to handle everything. Well, I fell flat on my face, I think pretty early on, whenever I thought that I was supposed to be the leader and not share that leadership. So when you think about, um, and I say all that to say, uh, 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 to get into really the power of a guiding coalition. So when you think about a guiding coalition and your collaborative teams, um, I know a lot of us have probably been a part of a leadership team. And so when you're thinking about the PLC process and you're thinking about um, what all you need to do, uh, be real careful about saying, oh, there's a guiding coalition. That's like the leadership team. Check, we have it. Um, I would, again, encourage you to look into the work of uh, um, uh, learning by doing. And also another great, great resource is leading with intention. Our guiding coalition, uh, we did a book study on leading with, inten leading with intention. I cannot speak this morning. Um, it's by Jeannie Spiller and Karen Power. Now, our school was very lucky in that and blessed in that the author of that book was actually a coach in our building. So she led us through the process. But anyway, let me, let me uh, get back on what we're talking about here. Um, the difference, if you think that you've got a guiding coalition in your building, but if you look at the traditional leadership team and this is what your guiding coalition is doing, you don't have a guiding coalition. I've been a part of leadership teams and this is what we did. We were the messengers for the principals. Um, the, the principal spoke, we took notes, we took that back. We were not the decision makers for the school. Uh, and also, have you ever been a part of a team that you really felt like this, this leadership team was like some sort of secret society and they were always the keepers of the information and you felt like you were stepping on toes if you had to ask what it was that they were working on? If that's the case, you don't have a, you don't have a guiding coalition. If the members of the guiding coalition are operating as managers and not as leaders, you again, you don't have a guiding coalition. A guiding coalition, they are the true protectors of the vision and the mission. And that may, may sound a little bit dramatic, but that really is what they are doing. We keep a close focus on the vision and the mission. The guiding coalition's work is all around curriculum and instruction. That is what we work on. Um, they are a change agent for the school. The, the biggest part for me is that they provide feedback to me. When we're in a guiding coalition meeting, it's not always me talking. It's a lot of times them talking to me. Tell me what's going on. What do I need to be aware of? Where do we need to work? Things like that. They are the true think tank of your school. Now, one thing that we did, um, because I do know in a school, you still need those managers. You still need those. And I shouldn't just say managers. They are you, There's another set of leaders in the school that you've got field trips coming up. You've got uh, 
kickball tournament coming up. You've got awards assembly. You've got all of those things that are super important to your school, but they are not the work of the guiding coalition. What we did at MIS, and Steve serves on that committee, is we have grade level chairs. I meet with them once a month. Um, and we didn't meet that often this year because, I mean, COVID was going on. There was really not a whole lot happening around here. Um, but I meet with them and they meet with their teams and get any, any of those things, like I just said, like we need to be aware of the activity schedule that's coming up and uh, we're getting ready to start a fundraiser. I organize all of that with the grade level chair. That work is very important, but it's not the work of the Guiding Coalition. The Guiding Coalition is only focused on the work of the PLC process. One question that we get a lot as well from teams is, and I think it's a legitimate question, um, people are like, I don't know what to do with the Guiding Coalition. Like we start out strong and we meet about once a month. That was really hard this year. Uh, the year before we met every other week, it was hard this year due to COVID. And so a lot of the things were just sent out through emails. But anyway, um, we'll have teams say, I don't know what we're supposed to be doing. I just, I don't, you say meet, but then what do we do? And if you don't know what you're supposed to be working on, you're going to slip back into that managerial. So I have on here, you keep your focus on the four critical questions. Our guiding coalition, some of the work that we've done, we come together at the beginning of the year or summer, depending on our school year. And um, we've done some really good work laying out the essential standards of all of our teams. And we look at those vertically. Your guiding coalition is a great, great group to help with that vertical um, alignment piece because you should essentially have someone from each grade level and representing each subject on your guiding coalition. So they serve as that vertical piece. Um, our fifth grade math team was struggling with some of their um, essential standards. And so Jessica serves on our guiding coalition. She sat with the fifth grade team. They reviewed the sixth grade essential standards and that really helped guide their work in the fifth grade. So that's the work of the guiding coalition. We've also brought, when you get to that second question, how do you know if they have learned it? That's your assessment piece. Our guiding coalition will bring assessments to the table. We've done assessment reviews. So that is what I mean that you keep it focused on the four critical questions. Um, they have been instrumental in planning our or intervention groups as well. So just really reflect on what your leadership team is doing. And if it's if it's looking more like the list over here that they're messengers and keepers of the information, you don't have your team yet. Um, and you've got to make that shift into that you truly are focused on the PLC process and that's what we work on. If at any time I'm talking too much and any of our participants need to stop me, please let me know. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, I'm actually finished talking and I'm gonna turn this over to um, Jessie. And she's going to, before we really get into the work, she's going to walk you through a way to rate your team and uh, really see where you need to put your focus for this school year. Okay, so yeah, we are going to talk about a self-assessment survey. We got together as the guiding coalition at the end of the school year and actually did, took this self-assessment for ourselves and talked about as PLC teams, like where were our strengths, where were our weaknesses, so where can we start working as we are moving into the next year. And then also when the PLC teams meet over the summer, they have also been revisiting this as a PLC team. So it is not just something obviously the guiding coalition can do. It is also something that you can do as a PLC team. And the purpose of it is to kind of monitor where you are at again with your strengths and your weaknesses. So Sarah, I don't think I have access to click on it. Okay, so there are 18 questions that go through um, and it also you write it on a scale of one to 10 and you focus on all the numbers but for today we are actually going to give you guys time to read through these statements and then rate yourself and see how true it is to your PLC team. But in, for time, we are going to focus on one, five and 10 
So one being that it is not true to your team at all. Five being you're, you're working on it. And then 10 being that you feel like that is a very big strength for your team. So for example, for the first one, we have identified team norms and protocols to guide us in working together. So if that was not true, you have not developed team norms and protocols, you would put a one. If you have started, but you feel like there's ways for improvement, you would put a five. And then if you feel like you have established great team norms and protocols, then you would give yourself a 10. So um, does anyone want to add anything else? Yeah, can, can, oh, Sarah. Yeah, we may have to scroll down at some point too. Or I yeah. don't know if I can put it in the chat and then you guys can open it up on your own. I don't know yep. if I have access to that. I'll do that right now so that you guys can scroll through and look at those questions and kind of identify for yourself where are your strengths and where are your weaknesses with the team that you are working on or working with. And then I know, for example, like on the second one where it starts talking about smart school or smart goals and specific, all of those, if you are unfamiliar with what smart school, smart goals are, um, Jessica will be talking about it here in just a few minutes. So I just stuck it in the uh, chat box. So we're going to okay. be quiet for just a second and let you guys scroll through there. And if you have any questions, um, we're we're happy to answer them during this time, but how about we give you guys about, I don't know, y'all want 10 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes, and we'll go through those. I'm even going to set a timer so I won't forget. Candace, I saw that your hand, I think that's what it said to me. I'm not sure that you're out there. I see it now. I saw the, is the PowerPoint shared to us through a email or for that form that you were just talking about? Because I'm having trouble finding that. Sarah put the form in the chat. So if you go down to the chat, you should see a link that you can click on and it will bring you up to the PDF of the form that we were oh, talking about. Yes, I see that. Thank you. You're welcome.
Okay, about one more minute. Um, I'm not sure if y'all need the full time, but um, I'll give you one more minute and then we'll reflect on it. Jesse? Okay, so um, I am going to ask if you feel like sharing one of your strengths and weaknesses, if you will. I'm going to start with sharing one of our weaknesses, and I know as a sixth grade literacy PLC team last year, and I know Sarah has already hit on it just a little bit, but if you look at uh, the statement on 12, where it says we use the results of our common assessments to assist each other in building on strengths and addressing weaknesses as part of an ongoing process of continuous improvement designed to help students achieve at higher levels. I think a lot of times that we focus on the weaknesses more than we do the strengths to try to help with our weaknesses to improve the higher levels of learning, but we really need to focus on those strengths as well, not just focusing on the weaknesses. And like we talked about just here in the background with our win time, and we'll talk about that a little later, we got so used to before COVID sharing kids and we would really focus on like our strengths and weaknesses too as teachers and help move our kids around based off where our strengths were and where our weaknesses were. And last year, we kind of got away a little bit just because we couldn't share those kids. So we're hoping with moving into the next year and being able to share those kids again, we will start focusing on those strengths again and not only the weaknesses. So I don't know if anyone else went over that and has a strength and weakness they would like to share, but we'd love to hear it. On, for me, I'm sorry if I can have... Um, a chance to talk about that one on number five um I gave ours a seven on that one because the essential standards is um one that we had like a common understanding because of most of the teachers in our um our English department at our level again I don't teach sixth grade but I do get my students I'm at seventh grade and eighth grade I teach a strategic reading class for seventh and eighth graders and that's part of our RTI process for our high school but our, we have a common understanding because we are a long, longer standing um, veteran teachers. Uh, there was one teacher that had three years of experience, but she was very independent and we would meet and um, those um, understandings of what the essential standard, standards were, but I always think that you can continually improve on that. And I felt like that was something that we probably didn't dis discuss as much as we should for one of our team members. So that's one area for focus for us for next year. I think that one that you just pointed out is probably um, where the most tears are shed if you're getting into this process um, because teachers don't always want to give things up. It's something that they've done for a while and they will say it's working, but um, is it is it really working or and is it really based on essential standards? Um, I think for us, once they got into that and and um, and I wasn't here the first year that they started this work. So I I kind of had the luxury of coming in after the tears were shed, I think, <laughs> and they were starting to align. But once you can truly align um, and you come to that agreement of what you need to eliminate, I, th I think it's a little bit more freeing, like, oh, now I really know what I need to do and that this is what I can really truly focus on. I went through a training one time I taught AP uh, language when I was in the classroom and in the AP training, one of the teachers always said, is it cute or does it count? And that always sticks with me because I feel like I was doing a lot of things that were cute, but they weren't aligned to anything and it didn't count for anything. So that's a really good place to start with that. I'm going to be quiet and see if anyone else wants to share.
I'll mention one more thing before we move on to, and just like Sarah said earlier, I know not really much administration is in on this, but one thing when I was going over this and looking at it in the learning by doing book that Sarah already shared, one of the things that said that if you are not like full into the PLC work yet, that you can make it just like a timeline. So if you've not identified team norms and you haven't done protocols, okay, well maybe have that done by week two. And then if you haven't started developing SMART goals yet, okay, well then make that week four, but you could use this 10 or 15, 18 question um, self-assessment as like a timeline, as a guide. Um, Jesse, I'm glad that you mentioned that because I was going to show you a good place if you're going to work through those norms and those norms or those norms, those critical issues are there, there's a reproducible on page 69 in the book, but if you also will flip over and look, um, we had to go through these continuums as a um, part of the cohort, but this is very, very powerful. It's on page 80 and 81. And it is just the PLC at work continuing building a collaborative culture through high performance teams. And it will just hear the indicators and then you will determine, are you pre-initiating, initiating, implementing, developing, or sustaining? And what's awesome about this is if you mark yourself as, um, let's say, implementing and that teachers have been assigned to collaborative teams that they're not really working together, you will, this is your roadmap for where you're wanting to go. If you are developing and there, even as a model PLC school, there are still some things that we would mark ourselves developing. We still have some work to do. We've made huge gains, but we still have some work to do. Um, so you, it will tell you exactly what it should look like. So this isn't just you going to your team and saying, hey guys, I think this is what we should do. It's right here for you to follow. So you, oh, there's a sweet baby. Um, if I was at home, my little one would be sticking her head in as well. Um, so anyway, this is a great, great, great guide for you uh, to take you through those critical issues. And they are throughout the book. There is at the end of each chapter, there is another continuum and, and they're all based around those critical issues. So that's a great place. Sarah, um, what book, Sarah, what book is that again? okay we refer to this as the bible it's our plc bible <laughs> and, and a lot of these you can get or the like the uh critical issues for team consideration i just went to the website as well and was able to pull that pdf so even if you don't necessarily have the book you can get some of the resources in it and just like that other continuum that sarah was just talking about if you go to um allthingsplc.com is a fantastic um, resource for you. It has tons of articles that whenever I'm getting ready to meet with our teams, if I know what the topic is, I usually will go on there and find a quick reading around the subject. It has tons of reproducibles. And the other thing that's amazing is you can research any uh, model PLC school in the country and, and in Arkansas, and um, you can go and see some of the templates that we've uploaded, other schools have uploaded. You can read all of their information and find the school that matches up with you. Like um, two of you mentioned, I believe that you're a Title I school. We are too. We serve a sim very similar demographic. Um, and you can search those things and go see some of the resources that they are using around building their team. Okay, I'm going to start sharing my screen again. Um, and let's get back to the PowerPoint. We're going to go over one more section and then we're going to take a 15 minute break. Here we are, present. And off we go to talk about SMART goals. Who is this? Okay, that's me. All right. Okay. Um, so in, in the 
slideshow here, I just kind of threw this acronym up here to just kind of um, go over each section of choosing your SMART goals. Um, most important to make sure that they're, you always make your goals where they're clear and, and um, reachable and they should be like, let's just start with RS. We need to make them simple. We need to make them sensible and significant. So what I'm gonna do is just kind of talk about each letter and then maybe some questions you can ask yourself while you're picking your goals. So on the first one, you can think of things like, um, what do I need to accomplish? Why is this goal important? Who is involved? As in what groups of kids, what other teachers, um, where is it located? Like where in my standards does this come up? And then which resources or limits are involved? Um, then we have the M for measurable. So this is make sure that it's meaningful and motivating. So how much um, and how many, Steve's kind of going to talk about that a little bit. And then um, how will I know that if, if it's being accomplished? So when I say how much and how many, um, how long is it going to take? Um, make sure that your standards, you're not assigning too many standards for that one um, SMART goal, those type of things, which he'll get to. And then on the A4 achievable, make sure that your group has agreed on what is important. And then um, make sure that you feel as a group that it is achievable. You don't wanna set a goal that's too high and that you get frustrated and you're not gonna achieve it. So some questions can be like, how can I accomplish this goal? How realistic is the goal based on um, other constraints that you may have? Um, one of those may be time, one of them may be financial. Just, you know, how can I accomplish this goal realistically? And uh, number four is relevant. So is it reasonable? Again, realistic, resourced, and results-based. Some questions you can think about is how, um, does this seem worthwhile? Is it the right time? Does this match our other efforts or needs? Am I the right person to reach this goal? And sometimes you're not. And it's okay if you're not. Um, we share kids. It may be a skill that I'm necessarily not getting across to my kids. And I may have to pull Shania or Steve in there and be like, I've done it. I've talked about it. I've done all I can do. Switch me and let's see what you can do. So you may not be the right person for it at that time. And it is perfectly okay if you're not. <clears throat> you may be the right person for the next goal and your partner may not be. Um, and then time-based is your T of your SMART goal. Make sure that um, it is time limited. So you're not spending too much time on one thing um, because that's a big deal. If you spend a whole lot of time on one area, then you're restricting yourself on what you can get to. So when we're going to do it, um, what can I do six months from now with this? What can I do six weeks from now with this? And what can I do today? Um, when we set our SMART goals, we kind of set them for like a 10% growth. So whatever we were last year, we might say, well, we want to go 10% up from that. Um, so in sixth grade, think this year, well, what, what did we strive for? 85, like 85% on stuff. So we would try to set it for 85. You may not be ready for 85. You may want to say, well, mine was 50% last year. I'm going to strive for 60. Okay. So you're going to try for 60%. If you get that 60% and you feel like it's time to move on, you still have 40% that didn't get it. So you're still going to have to wrap back around constantly and work with those for that 40% that did not get it, along with even the ones that did get it, kind of rechecking, making sure they still have it, that type of stuff. So it's a constant, you may be three skills in, but you're still working with this one, this one group of kids on the first skill you did. And that's fine. You're just going to keep wrapping that around, trying to get that percentage up as high as you can. Um, is there anything else I should add? Okay, just go ahead. Is Steve wanting to add something? Sorry, I had to get my volume turned on. I just want to touch on something that, that Jessica talked about as far as if there's a skill that you're trying to get across to your kids, and we all know this if you're in the if you're in the PLC program, we've got to get out of this this mindset that some teachers have a, these are my kids and I'm going to teach them and nobody else is going to, I'm going to figure out a way. 
some things you just don't do well. Some things I don't do well. And I'll go to Miss Franklin, I'll go to Miss Hunter and say, how did you, how did you do this? Or will you come teach my kids the way you did it? We, we've got to get past that idea of I'm the only one that can teach this group of kids. These are my kids. In, in actuality, every child in this building is my student and I'm going to reach whichever kids I can and the other teachers are going to do the same thing. And when we're all on board with that, and that goes back to becoming a true PLC. And I know when some people start this process and I was one of them, I'm like, I don't like this. This is isn't this isn't what I thought it was going to be. Uh, I was very negative the first first few meetings. And then I saw how well it worked and how we actually can reach the kids if everyone is on board trying to do that. So again, getting back to the idea of use whatever resources are available. And if that's another teacher, by all means, bring that other teacher in and help you get your get the job done. Uh, thank you, Steve. You said what I was going to. Oh, Jessica, did you need to add? No, I was going to ask you, is there anything that you feel like I forgot or I was going to yeah. see if anybody had any questions? Yeah, we can see if anyone has any questions. I think it's impart important to remember when you set these SMART goals, like Jessica said, uh, sixth grade math sets a goal of 85%. Um, but, and we usually run our units, I would say they're, they usually are within a 15 day cycle. So we're checking for understanding along the way. The first time they check for understanding, they may be at 50% and that is okay. But we've set that time of in the 15 days, we wanna be at 85%. Uh, what Steve said is so important and in a SMART goal is a great way to really um, get behind the idea of all kids because it's not 85% of the kids in your room. Mm -hmm. It's 85% of the entire grade. So they're going to share that data together. And whenever we look at our data, we always start with the whole team. As a team, where are you on this data? And if they are at 75% and Jessica has 100% of her students um, have met the goal, Jessica still sees that 75% and knows that she is still responsible for the 10% of the kids that we're trying to reach. So it's not just say, I've done my part, y'all got to get it together. And you know what, Jessica may be at 100% on that uh, specific target. And the next time Steve may be at 100%. And then the next time Shania may be at 100%. But until the team is at 100% or is at 85%, they're going to continue to change kids, switch kids, move them around until that SMART goal is met for the whole school and or for the whole grade. And then like Jessica said, we're not forgetting about that 15%. The SMART goal is just a way to really indicate that it's time for you as a team to move on, but we're still going to intervene on that 15% that we need to meet. However, if we're at 50% um, proficient at the end of that unit, we're not moving on. There's still work that we need to do to get us to that goal. So a SMART goal, um, and our teachers school-wide, it's really hard for them to not say 100% every time. Because if we say all means all, that's 100% of the kids. But still, that SMART goal, you got to look at that timely. When do I want to accomplish this? I accomplished my 85%. That, lets, that gives me permission to move on with our curriculum. But I also know that there are 15% I'm going to continue to spiral. Jessica also brought up a really good point with this. Once you meet your 85% or let's say even your 100%, we met 100% of our kids in September had this goal. You better believe we're going to touch on that goal. We're going to continue to touch and continue to recheck that goal with our students. We're going to spiral that learning back in. So anyway, best thing to remember with your SMART goal is make sure that it's actually attainable. Um, we do 10%. Why do we do 10%? Because we felt like that was attainable. We just move our goal 10% every year. Um, 
don't make it so small that you're just going to feel good about yourself and not work as hard as you need to, but not don't make it so big that you feel like you don't have anything to ever celebrate. Because SMART goals really are a point of celebration, which is a huge part of the PLC process. You better celebrate like crazy when you reach that SMART goal. Thank you, Jessica. And Steve. Um, do any of our participants have any questions around SMART goals before we move on? Reed, I'm not checking the questions. Are we all good? Yep, we're all good. No questions okay. so far. Um, okay, it's 9.30. Um, we are going to get into essential standards next, but let's take a 15 minute break. Um, so at 9.45, um, let's come back on here and we will tackle um, essential standards. I think that I have us taking a lunch break at 1130. So we'll see where we get with that. But let's just go ahead right now. It's a good stopping point before we get into essential standards, um, because that may take a while to talk about that. And if you teach sixth grade, I imagine this is where you're probably going to really have the questions because we're going to get into the specifics of sixth grade. So anyway, I'm done talking. I will see you back on here at 945.
I have 945, so I will just wait for everyone to jump back on here and then we will get started. Okay, who is ready to talk about essential standards? It's me again. All righty. Okay, so basically when it comes to essential standards, if you didn't have essential standards, you would never get to everything that needs to be taught. So there are so many standards in so little time to get through it all. Um, so basically this quote, I'm just gonna pretty much summarize it. Uh, but basically if PLC teams work to together to determine what is most important, so you determine those essential standards, you're doing it so that the students are still reaching that high level of learning that is needed. And there's some things to consider when we're really thinking about essential standards, we're thinking back to that, that first guiding question for our PLC of what do we want our students to know or what are we wanting to learn? That's where these essential standards are going to come in. Ready for the next one? I am. Okay, so again, this kind of aligns with those four questions, those four PLC questions again. So our essential standards are determining what we will be spending most of our time, we as teachers will be spending most of our instructional time teaching. It is also leading us into our assessment. So our essential standards, and then eventually, uh, Shani in a little bit is going to get down to breaking down our essential standards, so our learning targets. So what is going into our CSAs, and then what is going into our CFAs. And then these essential standards are also going to drive our conversations as teachers so that we have data driven conversations and discussions. And then also what we need to um, intervene on. So when we think of our two PLC questions of what will we do if the students have not learned the standard and then what will we do if they have. So not only thinking about that RTI, that remediation, but you're also thinking of that extension piece on where can you take the students further to have that even deeper understanding of the standard. And we talk about them all the time of our essential standards are our hills to die on. I was not here at the beginning, so that has been um, brought in. I don't, did that start year one with y'all, the hills to die on? Okay, um, but here's another acronym, just like we had one with the SMART goals earlier. When we're thinking of essential standards, we need to think if it is real or not. So when you are uh, picking your essential standards, think of if it's readiness. So are they going to need it in the years to come? So like, yes, we focus on sixth grade, but will they possibly need it in seventh grade? And we are going to look here in just a little bit on the literacy vertically aligned standards and the math vertically aligned standards. Um, the E stands for endurance. So again, is it needed beyond grade level, beyond assessment? I also like to think of, is it, could it be related to real life? Do they need it in the real world? Um, is it assessed? So also when thinking of essential standards, also be thinking of, we think of ACT Aspire. So is it assessed on ACT Aspire? And then also thinking of national assessments. And then does it have leverage? Will this standard apply across disciplines? So just to jump in there, yeah, um, your writing standards yes. uh, are huge. And clearly, you the, our students need to be good writers beyond the grade and beyond the assessment. Um, and using that leverage across all the disciplines when you think about writing. Um, inference is a huge standard for us. They will have to infer um, in science, they're going to have to infer in math, they're going to have to, in, inference is a huge standard. So whenever you're looking at your standards, um, run it through this. And do you have to do this work? Jesse, am I jumping in on something you're going to talk about? Uh, maybe, I don't know what you're about to say. Uh, do you have to do this work every year? Yes, that's, yeah, I was going to hit on okay. that. Okay, then I'll be quiet. No, it's okay. And um, when we think of essential standards too, we talk about there being about eight to 10 essential standards. Because again, if you are picking essentials, but you still have 23 standards, that is still so much that you are not realistically going to get to in a year. 
And so then with those eight to 10 standards, we revisit that process every single year. So like over the summer, when we have been meeting already, our PLC teams are looking back at those standards. Are they still essential? Are they still being assessed on ACT Aspire? Do we need to add an essential standard? Do we need to take away an essential standard? It is an ongoing process that is revisited every single year. Um, Because I know, and even just like we noticed as a sixth grade literacy PLC team this year, one of our standards when we were assessing it, the way we were wording it and the way we were questioning our kids was not the way that they had questioned them on ACT Aspire. It was getting into that point of view. Well, yeah, our kids could tell you, was it first person? Was it second person? Was it third person? But it wasn't getting to the depth of the standard that we needed it to. So it is something that is constantly revisited and added to or taken away if you see that that standard is no longer essential. Do you want to add something there, Sarah? Um, hit on it. One of the questions that we get a lot, um, if I have schools call us or schools come to visit us, is whose work is it of the essential standards? And listen, I have been, I have been guilty of this. Before I became an administrator, I worked as an, a, a, an um, instructional facilitator. Um, I served on a committee of few people. We determined the essential standards and then we handed them to the team. I thought I was doing them a service. I thought that that's what my role was. It is not the role of anyone else besides your teacher teams to um, indicate those essential standards. That is their work. Even if they agree with the essential standards that um, I picked out, they still did not go through that process. They still did not have those conversations around this right here. Is it real or not? Um, if you, this is the, this is, in my opinion, the most important step to gain that ownership of your teams. They have to choose those standards. I know that Jesse and I were on a webinar once together and that came up and they said, why is the state not just determining those essential standards? Because it's not the job of the state, it's the job of us. Um, the state has provided us with more standards um, and then it's our job within our districts to prioritize those standards. Um, and could they look very similar across the state? Sure, they could. We could all have chosen the exact same essential standards. However, it is the work of your team. Invest in your team. Make them the experts in this process where they can choose those standards. Um, and again, them gain that ownership of what they're teaching. Absolutely. Absolutely. If um, we, if we, if, if you leave that work to the instructional facilitator or another, if you're in a larger district where they get a district committee together, which is what I did um, before. And I thought I was, why wouldn't these teachers just want this? This is what I'm going to do for them. They had no ownership. They were not a part of the conversation of dividing up those standards and really unpacking them because part of uh, part of choosing those essential standards is you have to have those conversations, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, about how to unpack those standards. That is where all of the work happens. And if you are taking that out of the hands of your teachers, then don't be surprised whenever that unit starts to fall flat because they weren't a part of the conversation to really flesh that out. Yeah, and then just back to that hill to die on, as we were just talking about, it's like these are the essential standards that our kids have to know before moving for sixth grade, for example, before moving to seventh grade. Like it is so, so important that they have mastery of these standards before being able to move on into the next one. And then obviously we constantly year round and Sarah again's talking about it later with our RTI, but during our win time, this is where these standards are continuing to be hit on until those students are a mastery of those essential standards. Mm -hmm. One mistake that um, we, Sometimes see whenever you talk about, and this is why this slide is in here, sometimes the mistakes that we make is we don't really explain to brand new teachers that essential standards aren't it. You still have a responsibility with the other standards, um, but they're not the ones that you are necessarily having to set a SMART goal with. You are not necessarily having to assess as heavily as you are the essential standards. So we had this conversation with um, our fourth grade team. They had new team members and they uh, one of the veteran teachers was concerned because one of the new teachers was she was really moving ahead of everybody. And she finally she said, what are you guys doing? Like I'm teaching the essential standards. 
what's taking you guys so long? She didn't have that firm understanding that while you have your essential, you still are responsible for the other standards that are going to support that. So she wasn't slowing down to really teach all that she needed to teach with that essential and her data showed that. So we had to back up, make sure that we went back through and said, listen, while these are essential, the word is essential means important, not all, that's not all the standards, that's just what's most important. And Jesse, then, yeah, what do you ahead. want to click on first? Um, you can click on literacy, I guess, and status first, but these are going to be our vertically aligned document. So we look, this one specifically does fourth, fifth, and sixth, and then I know math goes up, but even just like being on the sixth grade PLC team, we also are in communication with the junior high with literacy, knowing what are their essential standards in seventh grade so that we know that in sixth grade, we are preparing them the best we can moving into seventh grade. But basically we take our standard and these are our essentials. And then we are also seeing. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and put this in the chat box for them oh, to. Okay. I'll like, you want me to while you're talking about okay. it. Okay. And then I will go back to a share now. And I'll pull that back up for you, Jesse. Oh, okay. I just pulled. Okay, you're good. Okay. Yeah, so you'll see, for example, the first one is back with that inferencing that Sarah's talking about. And that's one of those essential standards that even though it is essential in literacy, they are inferencing in science, they are inferencing in math, they are inferencing across um, content areas. So you'll just see that pretty much we have them vertically aligned all the way down. Um, and then we also look to like when we are planning in sixth grade, so maybe it's on our, just scrolling. Where do you want me to stop? It doesn't matter. I was just going oh, I'll stop. I'll I was stop just right going to pick one that you stopped on. So, um, for example, if you take like RI62 and RI52, we will look at those standards and be like, okay, so do we have to take, how do we take it to the next step from fifth grade to sixth grade? What is fifth grade standard asking of them that sixth grade is not? So we are able to see, have they had, um, any prior work with that standard. And um, they don't all, always vertically align. There may be a standard that fourth grade does that doesn't correlate to fifth grade, but that this is just documents that we use so that we can see um, what the essentials are. And then this also helps our big data wall in our PLC room as well. So for example, on this standard where I stopped, um, right, fourth, right. And fifth, fourth and fifth grade, it's just, it says provide a summary Mm -hmm. um, and then determine the main idea in text and explain how it's supported by key details. So four, two, and five, two are exactly the same. So obviously what's different about that is the text level text and the level. text complex complexity is going to be different. In sixth grade, it changes and it says provide an objective summary Which and then determine, yeah. yeah, and determine central ideas and how it's conveyed through particular details. So we will have a conversation in fifth grade and in sixth grade about how should that summary be different? What should we be adding to, in order to strengthen our uh, readers? And even the, I mean, obviously this is for writing as well. So those are the conversations that we have. I'm gonna stop real fast okay. and see if I can find, cause you just said something about our data wall. I think there's a picture on it, a picture too in later. The slides. Did I already, the slides, yeah, I just didn't, I know you're going to talk about it later, um, but we can okay. talk about it now. Well, let me, let me just jump, I'll come back to this. Let okay. me just jump and show y'all. I probably have it linked and then I'm not going to. I think it's an actual picture. Oh, 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 oh there okay, it there it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have that uh, document. That's a, a beautiful document. Sixth grade has one. Uh, Jesse already mentioned it. They met with our seventh grade team, which is not in our building, um, but we have a four, five, six building that vertically aligns our essential standards here. And then the sixth grade met with seventh grade and they have a document that works for them where it's a fifth, sixth, seventh grade. Because remember, if the standard is real or not, does it get them to the next level? Well, the only way that we're gonna know that is if we meet with seventh grade and vertically align. So that document is really nice to have. We don't mind to share it with you, but please, again, don't take our work as your work. You have to do this process yourself, but you can still use it as a template. However, this right here is super messy. 
And this is what the work actually looks like. So what you're looking at is in our, uh, we have a collaborative team planning room. Our teams um, come together in one area. If you don't do that, if your teams are planning in their room, please try to find them a spot that they can meet. Um, I have said this before, but I truly believe it. I believe the threshold theory that once you cross over into a room, your brain says, all right, this is my time to plan and focus on this work. Um, instead of if you're in your classroom, there are too many distractions. But anyway, so this that we're looking at, these are all of the essential standards posted up on the wall. The blue is fourth grade, orange is fifth grade, and that green is sixth grade for both literacy and math. Um, this is where we first start our data collection. But what is the reason I want to show this is because this work gets messy, but you've got to figure out what works for you. What works for us are having all of the essentials posted on the wall. So if we're in there together and we're planning and a fourth grade team is a little unclear on where they need to go with this standard, they're not digging through Google files to find the document, although we have it. They're walking up to this wall. It's posted. It's live. It's there for them all the time. Something else valuable that came out of this is, um, I believe it was last year, we started posting on the wall and I had put all of this up and man, we noticed the fifth grade math team had a ton of standards well over the eight to 10 that we had agreed upon that we were going to choose for our essential standards. Had it not been on this wall all laid out in front of them, they probably would not have noticed that either. So they went immediately to the sixth grade standards that were posted and they started looking to make sure that they were aligned. They were able to really quickly pull some things out. They said that's not really an essential standard, that's a supporting standard. So we make notes on this wall, we underline what we're teaching at this time. This was taken, I mean, it looks like in December, is when this picture was taken. If you were to see this at the end of the year, there are post-its everywhere. Um, there are notes made, they underline, they will go up to this. And in fact, Jesse asked me the other day what I had done with the, uh, with the wall, because I had taken it down to prepare for next year because fourth grade had written things that they okay. needed to remember next year. So anyway, um, the sixth grade team, they love some Google documents and some slides and templates more than anyone in the world. But if you're not there yet, this is a super simple way to get yourself organized. Slap those standards up on the wall so the whole team can see it. Again, this is a great vertical alignment piece because I don't know if you're like we are, it's really hard to get together with the other grade levels. So this at least is one way that they can see what everyone is working on. And we're gonna talk about like the data and things that are posted on there, but we use this constantly. We rip it down at the end of the year, they revisit their essential standards and then we'll post it again next year. Um, let's go back. Okay. Do you, do I need to open up the literacy standards? Um, I just, this is just one thing, just a reflection that sixth grade did that same standard you were talking about with main idea versus central idea, like fourth mm -hmm. and fifth is main idea, sixth grade is central idea. Well, we notice, like we call, we talk about it as being central idea and we do hit on like main idea, central idea, two different words, same concept. But we've noticed this year specifically on the ACT Aspire interims in sixth grade, they're still using the word main idea. So even though our standard calls for central idea, it's a mental note that we can also go back and make ourselves that like, oh, we need to be using those words kind of interchangeably to make sure that our students are still understanding that it's the same thing, no matter the way it is asked. Mm -hmm. That's it's such a good point. We, we came across something like that when we were talking about perspective and point of view. Point of view. Mm -hmm. That's a big one. Okay. Um, so again, if you would like a copy of any of this, we're happy to share it with you. We'll just make a copy of it and send it your way. But again, don't take our work as your work. Um, and again, you may have decided on the exact same standards, but that's super important that you come to that conclusion and not just say, hey, this is what MIS uses. Let's go. There's got to be that ownership like Jesse talked about. 
And I think math, the one that they linked, does fifth and or sixth and seventh, since we knew today was going to be sixth grade. But we also have a document that is very similar where we have fourth, fifth, and sixth for our building, so that we also have those standards for that data wall. Um, but again, they have linked the standard, and then they have also put the seventh grade aligned standard to the right of it. Um, I think Sarah may be about to put that in the chat. Is what it yeah, looks like. Yeah, I'm gonna doing. I'm gonna stop share real fast. I'm sure there's another way to do that. I just don't know what it is. Uh oh. And I'm posting these really quickly. Um, please don't change anything in these because I did not make a copy of it. But after this is over with, we will. Or if you want to get it and make a copy, that's fine. I just don't want. I just don't want too many people in the work if, if and changing it. So um, anyway, I just clicked on that and I did not mean to. So Jesse, you want me to go back? Ms. Stoball, can, can I just say something for a moment? When you, if you look you at the, the math document, you'll notice that everything that we teach in sixth grade for, I think that's the ratios document, doesn't necessarily align directly with seventh grade. And that's okay. We the the reason we want to have them there is so that we can see what is it does that seventh grade needs them to know about ratios that we can we can teach them in sixth grade to have them prepared when they get to seventh grade. And then if I could go back to the the previous slide where we talked about these aren't you know the essentials aren't all you teach. Uh, it's a little easier I guess in math than it is in, in literacy because in math you can have a lesson over ratios and you can talk about uh, common denominators you can talk about factors you can talk about multiples you can reach a lot of those uh, and the word you use was supporting uh, standards mm -hmm. you can cover a lot of the supporting standards while you're teaching that main standard that you're really focusing on so just going back to that idea of you yes there's too much to teach in depth but you have to teach it all. I mean, that's what the state wants them to know. So we've got to teach it all. Somehow we've got to figure out a way to tie it all together while we have those hills that we're gonna make sure we're, we're, we're getting those things done. Um, I remember in math, you can jump in on this. I remember specifically and what Steve just said reminded me of it. Um, I remember when we had Dr. Safi here, which he's fantastic. He's our math coach that was sent to us. Um, I believe he was from Florida State. And he um, told our sixth grade math team, a lot of what you're teaching, you don't really get to reap the benefits of the learning. The seventh grade and the eighth grade get to uh, reap the benefits of that learning. So for six, our sixth grade math, and he, he kept reiterating that with sixth grade math. I just want to say this. If you don't have seventh grade in your building where you can vertically align, we strongly encourage you to reach out to that team to see what it is, where are their essentials, because that's really going to guide what you're doing. Um, we don't want to set our students up for failure with the mindset of, well, I'm only going to be responsible for what we're doing here. A lot of the sixth grade standards, we're starting the process, but seventh grade gets to finish the process. And they, again, they get to reap the rewards of our hard work in sixth grade. But if all means all for our students, you've got to reach out to those teams. And it's the same thing with seventh grade in literacy too, but specifically in math. You've got to reach out to those teams to see what it is in um, even eighth grade when they're getting ready to start um, algebra. You've got to know what it is that their essentials are because sixth grade math teachers are vital in starting that process for them. Um, Jesse, does that wrap up essential standards for you? You're muted. I have no idea what you're telling me. You can't read my lips. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I said, I just, I said, yes, pretty much. But it's just so important to remember when you are picking those essential standards that you're collaborating with your team and you are agreeing on them with your team and you're taking that ownership for what you are going to be teaching. 
Um, and I think the same thing Shania will mention when she's doing the learning targets. I remember there was a situation where we had a pretty much a whole new PLC team and they weren't taking that time to go back and unpack those standards. And the teachers were not having that ownership of what they were teaching. So it's just so important to collaborate and work through that together so that you do know what is being taught in the classroom. We have a brand new, um, almost brand almost new, brand new. Uh, fifth grade uh, literacy team. And if you are working as a PLC, um, the easy route would be because we've done really good work around and essential have it all already. Yeah, so the easy route um, and in learning by doing, they always call those the dangerous detours. So a dangerous detour would be that I walk in, Jesse walks in and say, hey, we've been doing this work for four years, here are the standards go, no. We know that sixth grade, fourth and sixth grade, that conversation around essential standards for this upcoming year was probably a lot shorter of a conversation because they have unpacked together. They've gone through that process together. They were just really reviewing, making sure that they were on track. We have to start that process over with our fifth grade team. While Jesse and I may know exactly what standards they're going to pick and we will be there to guide them, and go through this process, it's not our work, it's their work. Um, and so, like I said, we we are um, in the sustaining portion of this, like we've gone through the work and I feel like the work we've done is sustaining. However, that team may be in developing because it's a brand new team to our school. So we're gonna have to start that with them. Okay, um, one more thing, and I think that this is what Shania is probably going to get into. And um, the team, y'all correct me if I'm wrong. Some of those essential standards are huge. We may not teach all of them at one time. You may start one portion of an essential in September and you may teach and then you may get back to the second half of that standard in December, in February, in other times. So uh, Shania is about to talk about someone's about to talk about unpacking. And that's why that process is super important because you've got to um, really make sure that you are getting all of the standard, but it not, may not be taught at all of the same time. Um, if you were to look at that wall really closely that I showed you, there are portions of it that are underlined and circled, and that's just the team's notes of this is where we're gonna start. We'll get to the other part of that later. Okay, unpacking. Okay, so I'm going to talk about unpacking the standards, picking your learning targets, things like that. Um, so when you unpack the standards, it helps the teachers understand and like put into words what we want the students to know um, and basically what we want to teach and what we want the students to be able to do. Um, unpacking the standards comes after you've chosen your essential standards. So you have to choose those and then you go into depth with the unpacking process. Um, and then it starts before you even teach. So you have to have these standards unpacked and um, analyzed before you go into actually teaching them. Um, the purpose and goal of unpacking them is to develop the standards into learning targets. Um, that's our, our big goal. So learning targets are um, what we intend for our students to learn um, from the standards that we've chosen. And then those learning targets turn into I can statements. So everything goes, it's like a, like a process. It's a big process. Um, so when you look at the standards, the first thing that you want to do is identify and look at your verbs. So when you look at the verbs in the standards, um, for example, it could be like, um, determine or evaluate. Those are the verbs that you will pick out and that um, helps you understand your skills that are being taught within that standard. And then after you found your verbs and your skills and all that, you go into identifying your nouns and the nouns um, helps you determine like the concepts that are being taught. So um, once you've done that, it goes beyond that. It's your turn. Yeah, I am. Do you want me to go ahead and click on your example? Um, yes, you can. Okay. Do. 
Okay, so in this example, we um, had a ratio standard. It's 6 RPA3. Um, and it says use ratio um, and rate reasoning to solve real world and mathematical problems. Um, and so from that, we developed the I can statement that says I can use ratios and rates to solve real world and mathematical problems. Um, and all of this was done in the first quarter. Um, and so I put in just one little portion of this um, unwrapped standard. And so we have the domain, which is, you know, the concept, it's ratios and proportions, um, and then the standard there. And so then we have it broken down into what will the students do? So these are the skills which come from your verbs. Um, and it says the students will describe the relationship between ratios. So your verb there was describe. So that's where we got that skill from. Um, can you go back up just a little bit? I sure can. Okay, and then our next little portion was with what knowledge or concept, um, this is, these are our nouns. So where it says like the concept, that's what it is. So um, what does it mean for two ratios to be equivalent? How can you tell if the ratios are equivalent? Um, and then in what context? So you have your verbs, you have your nouns. Now we're looking at the context of the standard. Um, this will be given in situations such as recipe batches or shades of paint. Um, and so basically it just, it breaks it all down into in what context are we trying to teach these equivalent uh, ratios. And then DOK means depth of knowledge. And that is literally what it says. What um, level of knowledge are you going to have these students getting into within this standard? And so there are three levels. Yeah, there the it's linked to. So. Okay, there's also a link for the DOK levels. Um, and we said this was a DOK level two. And then our CFA, uh, which is Common Formative Assessment. Steve is going to get into more of the assessment um, things, but this is where we chose to get those CFAs from, um, and we just put those in a little box also. Okay. There's four levels. Okay. Recall. Do, do you need uh, the next one? Go to the next one where the DOK levels few, are. Click a few times there, I think. Right here? Uh, one more. Yeah. One more time. Yeah. Okay. So this is a link of all of our levels in the DOK. Um, so there's four of them. And um, as you go up a level, obviously it gets more in depth and it has the students doing more um, rigorous um, tasks and things like that. I'm going to share it so y'all can open it up over here if you need to. Here you go. Okay. Shania? Yes? Where do I need to go for you now? Um, can you just go back to the um, PowerPoint? Here? We can't see your screen. Oh gosh, y'all. I'm so sorry. Um, goodness, a full time job over here trying to man this. Okay, <laughs> go back to present. Can you see it now? Yes. Why is it not trying to get to present? There we go. Okay, this slide, or do you need to still be on this one? Um, you can go to this one. Yes, this one's okay. good. So um, this is basically, this is what we, what I just showed you in the, um, the other document. This just kind of puts it into a different, this is literacy. There we go. So I showed you a math one. This is a literacy one. And it's the same process. You look at the standard, the verbs, the nouns, um, and you go into depth when you figured out those verbs and nouns and you just kind of go, you analyze it and you keep going into depth. Okay, you can go to the next one. Um, so this is our ratio um, unit. These are the skills and concepts that we chose um, for that unit. Um, and if you notice, each skill has a different DOK level. So if we look at the 
first one, it says solve. So solve is a higher D DOK level um, than, like, for example, use. So when we look at the, the solving, um, the PLC team has to look at the verbs and decide what they want to do with them. So, like, um, you have to look and you have to say, what do the verbs really mean? Not just like your, you know, standard definition of what does solve mean, but what does solve mean in a ratio perspective? And what do we want our students to understand when it comes to solving um, ratios? Um, and then you have to just look at, like, your mastery level. How do you determine if students really know how to solve it? So when you look at your verbs, it goes beyond just looking and getting a definition for those verbs. You have to really be like, okay, so when we say solve, I want it to look like this when my students actually um, do it. Or when we say understand, I want them to understand to this certain level. Because someone might know how to write a ratio, but if they don't know how to solve it using proportions, then we haven't really got to that depth of knowledge that we want them to be at. Um, and then there's some other questions that you have to ask yourself as a PLC team. Um, how do we know when students will have that skill? How do we know that they have mastered it? And then what do we do if we um, see that they aren't reaching that level of mastery that we want them to be at? Um, and you have to make sure that your team is analyzing the standards and the verbs and the nouns all on the same level, uh, making sure that everyone understands their role as the teacher. Um, because someone, you know, might say, okay, solve means this in my head, but if you're not together, um, you really won't get all students at the same level of solving, for an example. Um, and then you have to make sure that everyone understands the standards and is willing to teach and help each other out and do whatever we have to do to get our students on the same level. Yeah, so. so one thing that I found really interesting, Shani, if you don't mind me jumping in on this, um, in literacy, a lot of times we've, we had this discussion, and I think that uh, probably Jessica and Steve remember this, um, in literacy, when we look at the DOK levels, a lot of times we are planning our lessons around that we're going to, sometimes you start at that lower DOK level. Like, for example, there's a standard in fifth grade. I know this is sixth grade teams, but just stick with me on this. There's a standard in sixth, in fifth grade about understanding the function of um, nouns, verbs, adverbs, and how they work in um, sentences, the function of them in a sentence, not just identifying them. But a literacy teacher will always start with that DOK level, that lowest DOK level. They've got to identify what a noun is before they can ever get to the function. So literacy tends to, when you unpack these standards and you're planning those um, DOK levels and your instruction around them, you usually start at that lowest DOK level. However, in math, we work really, really hard uh, to not just teach students the steps and procedures, it's conceptual. And one of the things that we've talked about for the last few years are the entry points into the problem. And so sometimes, um, and I have a literacy background, so I had to learn this, um, and these awesome math teachers were patient with me. When I was noticing in their plans, sometimes they were starting at that DOK3. And I was like, why are you starting at DOK3? You've got to start at the bottom and then work up. You've got to see that progression. No, in math, there, there are a lot of times what they're teaching they're wanting the students to really understand the concept. So you may be starting with a big concept and in your plans, when you're unpacking these standards, Jessica, Steve, am I saying this correctly? You may be starting at that DOK three and you're gonna let the, the students really grapple with that problem and use all the tools that they have with that problem. And then you're going to step in. And so the DOK levels may go from top to bottom when you're thinking about math and you're thinking about those different entry points. So that was Ms. a big Snowball, that, that is that's really the essence of teaching math now is do they understand conceptually what you're talking about? And if we can get the concepts in when you get down to the using, you're not going to spend much time on that. You don't need to spend much time on that. They understand the concept. Now, can you use the tools? Can you solve the problems? So very little time 
time down on the lower levels and try to push all the learning up to those higher DOK levels because that's when, when they're really getting the meat of what you want them to get. Awesome. So I remember having that conversation and it was Jessica and Steve were in there and I'm like, what in the world with your plans? Y'all are not starting here. Why do we have a DOK one at the very end of this unit? But it's exactly what Steve just said. So don't, if you're an, if I were an IF in that situation, walking into a math uh, classroom, um, I would have told them that they were doing that wrong. I would have said, why are you starting here? That's not where you start. You got to go here. So DOK levels, whenever you're looking at your standard and dividing those up, especially in math, it does not mean that you have to work from the bottom up. It just depends on what the concept is, is, is that you're teaching. And, I'm, and I know that can be true for literacy. We just don't see it as much. In literacy, we usually follow that I do uh, you do, we do, I do, we do, you do, what, however it goes. Um, I know how it goes. I'm just sorry. I couldn't think of it off the top of my head. Um, but in math, that's not the same. So uh, Shania, thank you for dividing that up or for talking about um, that with us. One more thing with your I can statements. That is the first introduction into the lesson for the student. If you've written it in terms that the students do not understand what you're talking about and they don't know what their goal is for that day, don't expect a whole lot of engagement there. So remember the I can statement is for the student. What is it that they're going to do? You know how to teach this, you're the expert, but it's I can do this for the student. So make sure that it's written in a term that they understand. Okay, any uh, read? Are you seeing any questions? Do we need to stop on anything? Do you need to jump in? I have not seen any questions yet, but I think okay. I'm going to jump in next. Okay, so I'm going to keep on. Oh, was that, did I need to, are you ready right now? Is this yep. you? Yep. All right, take it away. Okay, um, any of our participants, does anybody have ELL students in their classes or have a big ELL group in their district? I can't see everybody's. I think between between my two classes, I had about five. Yeah, five. Candace, did y'all do y'all have any in Mercury? Olivia, I know y'all have some at Jonesboro. I don't know. Do y'all have, have, have less than 5% of Hispanic? And I have one student that's from Pakistan. Okay. I didn't have um, as many this year that I, um, when I did like my first year of teaching. I think I only had two in one class and three in another class. Okay. Are they generally higher, um, higher proficiency level kids or are they more mm -hmm. new arrival kids? Um, they're typically higher proficiency kids. I did um, my first year have um, a zero proficiency child, so this should help me a lot because it does happen. Yes, it does. And I don't, anybody else have any other? Um, so if you've never heard of ELP standards, they are, there are 10 standards um, that were put together by Stanford University Language um, a language team and the 10 standards align with common core standards and the next gen science standards. So they have put together 10 standards that basically encompass, you can assign um, to all the common core math, ELA, and then next gen science standards. Um, so what these, so what the ELP standards do is um, tell us what ELL students will do um, with your content standards. So those verbs that Shania was talking about, a lot of those verbs that you will, you will see in the ELP standards as well. So they'll be easy to um, attach to each other. And the ELP standards will tell you um, what a level one should do with this standard, what a level two can produce with this standard, what a level three student, four and five and so on. Um, so Sarah, if you go to the next slide for me, I'm gonna pull up a, will you click on the ELP? Yeah. Oh no. Let me see. Hang on. It'll yeah, just if you'll go back in there, it'll take two seconds and I can click back in it. We've got plenty of time. Did you get an email from me? Yes. Okay. 
Okay, let's see if it'll go now. I think I changed the other ones. Okay. Ready? Let's see. Yep. Here they are. Okay. So, so these. These are the these are the ELA math and science practices, um, the the essential common core and next gen standards that they pulled out. If you notice, a lot of them start with the verbs that Shania was talking about that align with the DOK levels, the use model construct, um, build all those kind of things. If you once you unpack those standards and pick out those verbs, it will be easy for you to come to um, this matrix and attach. The EOP, the EOP standards to your um, essential standards that you've unpacked. So on the left hand side um, are some of the essential standards that they have pulled out from the Common Core standards and the Next Gen standards. And if you look on the right side, um, it tells you what EOP standard it aligns with. This is, I teach language development at Paragould Junior High and Paragould High School. Um, we have over 20 languages spoken in our district. Um, I had five new arrival students um, just in my class of eight alone this year at the high school. Um, we've got kids uh, from Guatemala and El Salvador, and we have a lot of Marshallese kids at our school. Um, we have a large African refugee population um, that have resettled from Memphis. Um, they're in and out all the time. I think my roster changed six or seven times this year um, with just the movement that our kids have. So. Um, but I also push in to, I co-teach fifth and sixth grade. I um, co-teach sixth grade math and sixth grade language. And then I also push into our fifth grade classes as well. So that's my connection to sixth grade. Um, but I am in there for our ESL kids, but also to help our teachers um, align these standards so that we make sure we're reaching our ESL kids and making the content accessible to them. Um, and the biggest thing about our ELP standards is making sure that we are not watering down what the standards, but making it accessible. And there's a big difference in watering down and making content accessible to kids. Um, so Sarah, if you will go to, I think it's the next one. I may have to give you permission for that one too. Yeah, the last two should be good then. Reed, I think what you said is so important about giving them access and not watering it down. I made that mistake um, early on in my career when I taught, um, and I didn't really uh, change a lot about what I was doing in the classroom, but all I would do is modify the assessment. And, oh my goodness, I wish I could take those kids back and apologize to all of the kids. That goes for anyone that I served with uh, an IEP or um, ESL student, um, because they, the, we oftentimes mistake their ability due to a language barrier, and um, that's just wrong on so many levels, so I'm so glad that you were talking, talking through that. I think we have a, I like that, yes, and it, it looks very, the first time I looked at the ELP matrix, I could not, figure it out for the life of me um, because there were so many things that it was aligning with. Um, but after I looked at these other matrix, matrices that I'm gonna show you, it, it made a little bit more sense. So this is um, the grade six ELA matrix. If you look on the right-hand side, these are the 10 ELP standards. And these standards are gonna go for science, math, ELA, and can also be aligned to history. They're pretty broad. Um, so you can tack on just about any standard um, that you're gonna be teaching into one of these standards. Um, again, they, they start with verbs, construct, participate, analyze, critique. Um, and although, like if you look at number six, for example, analyzing critique arguments of others orally and in writing, um, we assign that one to math a lot because when you read math um, word problems, uh, we've got to look at the argument of the word problem and dissect it um, and be able to show your work or explain to a partner, um, you know, what's happening in that word problem. So just because it has speaking or writing in it doesn't mean that it can't apply to your math classes and your science classes and things like that. Um, 
if you scroll down just a little bit, it has a legend at the bottom. So it tells you what all these letters over here on the side mean. The RL is reading for literature, um, writing, language and speaking, all those kind of things. Um, let me see, go back to this one. Um, so the main thing that you, so the EOP standards will do, like I said, is tell you what each level should be able to produce. So Sarah, if you can jump back to, Um, standard one. On the grade six document or? The very bottom one, the standard, the grade six standard one. Oh, still off right in front of me. <laughs> okay, so, so if, and Shania's math lesson about ratios, I looked at that, um, the ICANN statements and the unpacking that she did, and I attached it to the EOP standard one. So I know you have LPACs or um, whatever your district calls them for your ESL kids. Um, and it tells you their overall proficiency level. These levels that it gives at the top tells you what a level one should be able to produce at this standard. Okay, now this is at the end of that. So if they're a level one, at the, by the end of level one, they should be able to produce this for you. At the end of level two, a level two can produce this for you. Um, now remember their reading level differs from their listening level, their listening level differs from their writing level. So you're going to have to do a little bit of legwork and go in and look at those, um, those different levels. I print these standards out and I write my kids' names in them, in the boxes. So that when I look at my standards, I know that Tom is here and Sally is here and you know whoever is here, it makes it a lot easier than me having to go back and forth between paperwork all year. Um, so for level one, um, a limited set of strategies, identify a few keywords. You know your level ones are usually nonverbal their first year, don't feel very comfortable in your classes. Um, so while your, your standards are essential for that grade, yes, exiting sixth grade, your kids should know this. Um, but you really, for ESL kids, need to get down to the nuts and bolts of what's important for them to continue their language learning as well. So when you talk about ratios, okay, chances are, well, a lot of times for my kids anyways, the schooling that they've come from, the background they've come from, they have no idea what a ratio is. So it's a big assumption for you to start teaching ratios in your sixth grade class and for you to think that they know the background of what a ratio even is or what a fraction even is. Um, we were teaching addition to a new arrival sixth grade student this year. We were talking about fractions and we do the multiplication test and all that kind of stuff. And we realized that he didn't even know how to add. Well, if you can't add, then you definitely are gonna struggle with multiplying, which means you're definitely gonna struggle with fractions. And I mean, the ripple effect just continues obviously. So um, obviously these standards are important, like I said, to move on in progression, but you've got to decide those verbs, what that verb means for that student, especially your lower level student. And it's not gonna look like your native, your native speakers. Um, and the set, we'll talk about assessments later, um, but the assessments will look different. What you can expect them to produce will look different. That doesn't mean they can't master the standard, but how, how they master it will look different. Um, so these are just, I know we talked about Hilda Dion for your essential standards. These are, these are just a, um, an additional resource to help you scaffold and know what to expect. Because like I said, you need to know that what they produce will look different than what your native speakers will produce. And that's okay because, and I know you've heard this with what's going on in the world, um, fair does not mean equal for everybody what your ESL kids, and this, this applies for your SPED kids as well. This could easily be applied for your SPED kids with IEPs or 504s. Um, what they need to be successful and, and produce to master that standard is not gonna be the same as a native speaker or one who um, doesn't have an IEP or a 504. So that's a lot of information. Um, are there any questions that I can answer right now or you wanna go back and look at and ask about? 
a lot of really good information that it's important that we plan for it early on um, instead of getting into it and then it becomes an afterthought. So it's really, really good information. Um, do I need to click on anything else for you? Um, I just I just noticed it's on the standard. Will you click on the standard one again? Sure. I think I still hold up. Oh, Is this it? Yeah. If you look in the middle, it says MP1. Um, and the MP is a math standard, uh, makes sense of problems and persevere in solving them. So if we're solving ratios, that would obviously correlate with um, this general common core standard. So it's also kind of a cheat sheet, I guess, when you look at standards to say when you align your math standard for ratios, that this standard one will match because it has, like, I, like we talked about your verbs, um, persevering solving problems and also has them for science the sp1 ask questions and define problems and then your ela standards are over on the far left side so i just wanted to add that in there okay before i think this we're we gonna tackle this before lunch i guess so Who is doing the essential standards leads to developing unit plans? It's me. Okay. Oh, are, we, are we doing this before lunch, I suppose? What? Yeah, we are. Okay. We don't have to get into it before lunch. No, let's go ahead. It's 1040. We've oh, got hold time. On. I can't hear you. Oh. Yes, ma'am. I said, no, let's go ahead. I had it, I had it wrong on my list, but it we have a slide in here for lunch. So let's tackle this and then we'll uh break for lunch as soon as we're finished. Okay. So once you have your essential standards and you have your learning targets, then we start developing our unit plans. And really what is important to know about our unit plans is it covers continuously those four PLC questions. So it is constantly, and we'll look at this in just a second, but it's constantly looking at what do we want our students to learn? It is doing, how will we know when putting in our CFAs and CSAs? And then what will we do if they haven't? And what will we do if we, they have mastered the standard? So there's a little um, flow chart, I guess. I don't know what you would call it. Little diagram um, that kind of shows you it's ongoing and kind of the order that you would do your unit plan in. So once you have identified those essential standards and you've unwrapped those essential standards and gotten your I can statements, that is when you will collaborate with your PLC team to create your CSA. So that summative assessment that will come at the end um, and then I know Steve is going to get more into talking about what all goes into a CSA and CFA here at the end when it comes to like having that common scoring rubric. And then once you have created your end of unit assessment, that is where your SMART goal comes in, which Jessica talked at the beginning. Um, you have your, oh, I think I mentioned learning targets with essential learnings because we just kind of do all of that at the same time. Then you're creating your CFA, so those little checks for understanding along the way while you're in your unit. You come up with your instruction, that your, your instructional strategies and your activities that you will be using throughout the lesson or throughout the unit. And then, of course, once you have given those CFAs, you're going to be examining, or CSAs and CFAs, you're going to be examining those results, and you're going to use that data to reflect, reteach if you need to reteach, and extend if you need to extend. And there's an arrow because it is just a continuous cycle when you are in that unit. So even if you're given a CFA, you're going to talk, you're going to act on it, you're going to reteach if you need to, and it's just that constant cycle. Does anyone want to add anything about this diagram? Um, I, I talked, like I said yesterday, I was in Pine mm -hmm. Bluff at a, am I muted? Can y'all hear me? No, we can hear you. <laughs> okay. Um, I talked yesterday at a conference on assessments, um, and we had a, a long lengthy discussion around when the planning of the, uh, common assessment should happen. And if you notice, and I'm sure Steve is going to get into this, if you notice that is coming, like Jesse said, right after the end of unit common assessment. Now, that is not necessarily how we started, but that's where we are now. The reason is you will be a better teacher if you already know what your end of unit mm -hmm. common assessment is. Mm -hmm. Don't do what I did as a first year teacher. I taught, 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 and I'm sure we've probably all done this or 
probably not. Y'all are probably just better than I was. Um, I taught, 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 and then I made my unit assessment. Well, that unit assessment was based on how well I taught. Oh man, I really hit that concept. I'm going to put a lot of questions about that concept. And then this we didn't really get to, so I'm going to take it off. You cannot trust your data if you are working that way. So when you go in to plan your unit assessment or your uh, unit plan, that assessment has to happen early and you better stick with it. Um, I worked with a teacher that she would, even when we knew better and started putting the common assessment at the beginning, uh, she would go back and edit her test and take out what she didn't think that the kids really knew. Well, if an assessment is to inform our teaching, we can't take those things out. They have to be in there. So anyway, I just wanted to point this out to you. This is a, um, this right here should really guide your work and it should really guide the work of your guiding coalition because we should see where our teams are on this continuum. And if we're struggling with a certain area of this, um, our guiding coalition can come together, brainstorm how we need to support our teams, but everything centers around this whole flow chart that we have. And it just continuously goes in a circle. Um, we have just an example of the math unit plan and the literacy unit plan. We use the same template no matter what um, content you teach. So in our unit plans, we have those four PLC questions that we constantly go back to. Um, so at the beginning or the top of our unit plans, we have our norms that we um, set with our teams. We put in our, we always have our mission vision. So everything that we can remind ourselves of at the beginning of the unit, we also make sure that we have a long-term goal and our SMART goal. Um, then it goes into what are essential learnings. It goes into what are our unwrapped standards with our DOK levels so that we know the rigor of the stand, like what rigor of the standard we need to get to to reach. Um, on both, we will have academic vocabulary that is important for the students to understand to master the standard. We have our common assessment. Most of the time, they are also, we try to make sure that they are linked. You will see that this one is. There's also a scoring rubric so that we know that no matter who is teaching it, we are all assessing it the same way. Um, we also leave that very visible for our kiddos so that they know what is expected them at each level of mastery. Um, and you'll see that they have the exceeding ready, close, and in need of support. Um, they have the learning targets again. And then we have weekly assessments. This is where we will also a lot of times link those CFAs. And then we have digital data trackers that we all use as teachers, where we go in to put in our individual students' data. And we have them color-coded green, yellow, and red. So like they've mastered it, they're close, and then they, have, uh, they are in need of support. And then once we revisit that and reteach that standard, and if we give like a, um, I guess retake, you would say, kind of. Um, we will, it is continuously updated, that data tracker is. Do you want to look and at this one? We can. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be the same thing for literacy. Again, it's the same exact format, even though it is a different content area. We have our norms, our goals. Jesse, what digital um, tracker, which, what, is that a certain software or do y'all just use Excel? We use just Google Sheets uh, yeah. and there's one. I don't know if it has students' names on it. Yep. Um, I really you want to hide that. Business and finance class where I'm working on my administration license and mm -hmm. we looked at a model um, school action improvement plan and mm -hmm. that in there um that principal had in his action plan he had listed easy cbm um but it's it's a free resource and it actually i have not had time to look at it but i'm looking at it this summer um because we have been just using google sheets and so mm -hmm. i'm gonna look it's easier to use versus the google sheets uh, and um you know and how do you use the the google sheets and what i needed are you doing that after class, how much percent of your time are you using to record this data? We are use it, doing this for you. Yeah, and I guess it could be different for everyone, but um, we typically 
we have the same planning every single day. We are very fortunate that we do. So a lot of times, like if we take, when we are taking them, we sit down and grade them during planning and then it's like automatically put in. I know some of the math tests are digital. Don't y'all take some of yours digital? So the feedback or the feedback would be quicker. So then it goes in, but I am not, I, do, I never feel overwhelmed by the time it takes me to put this into the spreadsheet. I guess, I don't know if y'all have Thank any you. different opinion. Um, was that Candace that asked that question? It is. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Candace, we used last year, our um, district had purchased, um, and I'm not even going to remember what it was called, but um, they had purchased basically a data tracker for us, and it was pulling from, some of it was pulling from e-school attendance and all of these things that we can use. Um, I did not like it as well as um, just using Google Sheets. I think what's most important is just deciding what it is that you want to track. And then um, like Jesse just said, they sit down and grade together and they pop it in there. Now, this is what they use for sixth grade. Mm -hmm. I'm not tight on how they track it within their teams. At the end of this, I'll show you a link for what I like for them to use. And it's not even numbers. It's yes or no. It's got the kid's name. Yes, do they have it? No, they don't. And then we talk about the data from there. But we did have another product. And again, clearly I didn't like it. I can't even remember the name of it. Just that was said Global PD. No, it wasn't the Global. Yes, we did have Global PD. Oh, that was okay. part of our PLC agreement. But we used... Um, we used another resource and I didn't see what it did any different than us using our own Google Sheets. One reason that I liked the Google Sheets better is because we had better control. Um, sometimes the data, it wasn't necessarily, and you know this happens whenever you outsource this kind of um, work. Um, it wasn't, it, it may update at midnight every night. It may not. Um, the cells, like where we needed to input our data, um, what we found is that if we did a reteach, Google Sheets, we have complete control of that. We could go back and just change the number right there if we needed to. And a lot of those programs, it required that we set up a whole nother cell for it. And we, um, we serve 550 students. That's not an overwhelming number for us to just take care of that data ourselves. If it was a much larger district, perhaps that could be more beneficial. But for us, it basically was doing what Google Sheets were doing for us, but with us having less control over it because we had to talk to it to tell it how to set it up and then wait for it. And it, we just did not like it as well as what we could do with Google Sheets. And my only other thought on that, um, so the teachers didn't do as much with it because they put it into their Google document or Google Sheets because that worked for us. And then um, admin, we were really the ones that were trying to pull the data from it um, and having to put in the information. Um, it didn't really, as you get more into the PLC process and what we're sharing with you today may not work for you. You may want something else. I find that some of those programs that for tracking the data they don't really work the way that we want to work within a PLC. So I guess my bottom line is that you have full control over Google Sheets and we haven't found anything that it couldn't do for us that another program did. Um, I don't know if that helps you at all. Hey, Jess, yes. Or Sarah, Steve would like, oh, sorry, Candace, go ahead. I cut you off. Ask, ask your yes. question first. Yes, that does help. And that is what I was currently doing was just use Google Sheets to record in the middle and end of the year data for mm -hmm. RTI supervisor for over reading interventions. And that's what we are currently using is the is the Google Sheets as well. But I had just seen that and I thought, well, maybe I'll check that out. But I'll take your advice and just stick to what we're doing. Well, I mean, and hey, you may be better than me. You may find out that it works for you better. And I'm not familiar with the program that you share, but I just know that we did go down that road last year. And um, I didn't I didn't like not having control. Like, obviously, it's a program that's been written a certain way, and you have to work within that program. Google Sheets, you can make it do what you need it to do. So that was, that was just my experience whenever we did that. And I was very... 
I was thankful that I've got an awesome superintendent who once we said, this is not working how we need it to work. He said, well, then don't do it. Just go back to what you, what you know works for your team. So um, Jesse, what were you going to tell me? Yes. Um, Steve wants you to go. I'm echoing for some reason. Um, he wants you to go back to the math unit plan and click on one of their data trackers and he has something he wants to say about it. All right, Steve. We'll let you say something about it then, young man. Yeah. I, I just like to do too much talking. Uh, would you go down to where the student data tracker? Would you click on that for just a moment? Open that up. I was going to mention that. So go, you oh. go, Steve. Okay, I'm sorry. You go. No, no, talk about it. Go. 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 Jesse was going to share this with you as well. Uh, we use we use this to allow the students to track their own data so that they know exactly where they stand. So down at the bottom, it's just, you know the date, the title, the goal. And the, when we say goal, we ask them if we're going to take an assessment, what do you think you're going to do on this assessment? How well do you think you're going to do? And they go in there and they estimate that and they can drag and drop these boxes, uh, red, yellow, green. Then after we give the assessment, they go back in there and more often than not, seems like they've done better than what they thought they were going to do. So they get to drag that box on up. So that's just a very visual way for them to see how well they've done on the different assessments, whether it's a CFA or a CSA. Uh, Ms. Lobo, if you'd close that out now and go down to the next, the next link on that document. No, that's not it. <laughs> oh, on your, um, back, back to the sheet we were on. Yeah, go back to the math unit plan. Okay. <laughs> I've got and so many. Scroll on down on it, please. Keep going down. The student proficiency tracker. Would you click on that? This goes back to whether or not to use Google Sheets. We love Google. I love Google Sheets. I think we, we all do because it's a very easy, very visual way for us to see what's happened. So we've done in this case a mid-unit CFA, just to see where the, where the students are at. And we put this 12, 16 to tell us we needed them to score 12 out of 16 points on this. And if we're there, we're on track to where we need to be headed. And as you scroll down this, you'll see it either came up in green, yellow, or red. So we go in there and we format it so that when we put that score in, immediately if it pops up green, hey, we know they're, they're where they need to be right now. We can move on. If it's in yellow, they're really close. There's some little something they missed. If they're in red, hey, this didn't happen for them. We need to go back and, and see what went on. Then in the next column, uh, it had a reteach. So we went back in just on our own and we retaught our kids. Did we get them to where they need to be? And we had their new score in for that. But then over here, it says the breakdown, and we know in each individual target what, what they got, what they didn't get. So we know where we need to do our reteaching based upon this. That's why we like these sheets, because we can get it all there, easily done for us, so that we can see real quick what we need to focus on when we're reteaching. That, that's all I wanted to say. Sorry. No, not sorry. That's great information. Um, this is what I just want to say this and we're getting really close to um, Jesse are there more slides for you. You're muted you're muted Jesse I know after over a year and a half of zoom we no, still. Gonna, um, no I was just going to say how we talked about how we track data and then the students track the data this year we also started doing like visible learning in the hallway where we do that same bar system like the um, green yellow red where it is the whole grade level as a whole of where they are at mastery towards the standard as well so that they can see how they are not even individually but as a whole grade level now i'm done okay so um just we've got a few minutes before we're going to break for lunch but why are we talking about student tracking when we were just talking about unit plans because it's in our unit plan um when we first started 
it all, it didn't seem like it went together. And that unit plan that you that we showed you is not what we started with. We had broader unit plans that really tackled like the questions one and two, but it didn't necessarily include the three and the four. So through this process, um, we noticed, they, they reflected and noticed that most of our collaborative team planning times were always focused on that one and two, just getting to what we were going to teach and maybe not truly getting to that data. So that data piece became part of our unit plan. Um, so that's why we're talking about that right here, because that unit plan is what works for us to make sure that we complete that cycle. So if you're in the middle of working on a unit plan and their planning time um, is from 12.05 to 2.05. So if it's 2.05 and they stop and shut down that unit plan, they know when they get back together, they pull up that unit plan exactly where they need to start. So that sort of works as our agenda as well. Now they still set an agenda for what they need to accomplish, but that's why we're talking about data tracking right here. And Shania just talked about breaking down those standards. So we're tracking that data. And if you look at that continuous cycle, we're going to go back and see what portion of the students didn't get it. And we go back to our can statements. And then that's how we're going to form our win groups, which we're going to talk about our intervention block after lunch. So I have 11 o'clock um, before we leave. Are there any questions that we can answer from the group? Um, when we come back this afternoon, we are going to dive into I don't even remember what all we're going to dive into, but some of it will be the RTI process. But we wanted to leave a pretty good portion of the day for you guys to say, this is all great information, but this is where I need to start where we can just have a conversation. So before we go, I'm going to stop talking. Uh, Reed, do we have anybody that have any questions for us? No. Can I add something real fast? Of course you can. Um, can you click on the literacy plan really, really quick again? Click on, I'm sorry. The literacy plan in the last slide you just had. Yeah. Let me share my screen one more time. I got out of there too soon. So in so in this unit plan, um, we talked about aligning the ELP standards. So if you have ESL students in your classes or um, big numbers of ESL students, um, where they assign the essential, the essential learning standard. Um, and then I think, sit down. Can you scroll down? Yeah, can you scroll down a little bit? Yep, for sure. Where was it? I keep, I keep scrolling on my computer like I have, like I've enjoyed it. <laughs> um, so up at the top, I guess, where the essential standard was, um, is where you can also just just pop in your ELP standard um, and yeah. and that will be able to help you track um, your proficiency um, for your ELL students as well. So just just to um, add in where you can put that in if, if you have ESL students in your classes. That's all I had. Okay. And that's an easy thing to add to our unit. Okay, guys, uh, thank you for spending your morning with us. We will see you back. We're going to uh, join you. It's 1102. Let's all be back on here at, I don't know, 1210. Does that work? And we will get back into uh, the rest of our day. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we've got a few more things to go over. I'm thinking we may end a little bit early, but we will stay on here as long as there are questions for us to answer. Um, so with that in mind, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And if there's anyone who had any questions that came up um, over your lunch break, I hope you had a good lunch break. Um, but if there's anything that came up that you wanna ask, um, let's just take a few moments to see if we need to reflect on anything and then we'll get started in the second half of our day. I have my screen shared so I can't see if anyone's typing any questions, I don't think. Are we all good? Nothing yet. We're good. Um, well. 
Okay, well, my screen doesn't want to move. Hmm. Okay, hang tight. I'll stop sharing and see. Oh, goodness. Oh, there it went. There it went. Okay, so let me share again. Okay, Steve, is this you? Are you going to take it away with assessments for us? Okay, I think, hang on a second. <laughs> okay, yeah, we're going to be talking about, uh, about assessments now and, uh, you know, we all, we all know, we, we know how to assess. We give a lot of assessments, uh, anywhere from the state assessments down, down to the district assessments to the classroom assessments. But the idea here uh, with the PLC is to plan those assessments out. And as was stated earlier, if we just teach and then write an assessment, we are gonna write an assessment that just covers what we've taught instead of covering what we have decided already are the essential things. So the, we need to get together and luckily we're in a building where we do and plan our assessments when we start to plan our unit. So we know what the essential standards are and based on that, you go ahead and plan your assessment, then you plan your teaching around the assessment. So as this, uh, as this screen says, you create that common formative assessment uh, or summative assessment, whichever the case may be, that aligns with that, uh, this says prioritized learning, that is those uh, essential standards that you're, that, you're trying, that you're trying to get across, and then create a proficiency scale because if you don't know in advance what you're going to call proficient, you might tend to lower that expectation if the scores aren't what you think they should be. So if you go ahead and do your proficiency scale at the start of the unit, then, then you're, you're good to go on that. And then you decide on the guidelines and that involves literally everything you're doing. What questions you're gonna give, is everybody gonna give exactly the same test, which you really should in the grade level. And you know, are you gonna do it on the same day? Sorry, I got an echo happening here. Sorry if it's that going for you. Uh, and you know what, what day is it going to be completed by? If you start to give an assessment, when's it going to be completed? And that goes along with when is the grading going to be completed as well? And even further than that, what instructions are you going to give when you give that assessment so that every single classroom gets exactly the same test on the same day with the same guidelines of instruction? and then create that scoring you know and go ahead and do that scoring on it and i'm going to show you a sample assessment uh, in, in a moment and you know rank your kids it says norm how did they do compared to what everyone else has done and you also need to predict and i know we all as teachers do that anyway we pretty much know uh, or we think we know going into an assessment who's going to do very well we, we think we know who's going to do poorly, uh, but we need to go ahead and go through that process because it will help us when the assessment's over know, well, the students I thought would do well, if they didn't do well, why didn't they do well? Or the students who did a lot better than you anticipated they were going to do, why did they do so much better? And we'll get to the why uh, on that in just a moment. Okay, so you've, you got the assessment ready, you make the assessment, you give the assessment, and again, hopefully everybody uh, in your grade level is doing it on the same day. So you implement that, you score it using the guidelines that you your group or your team has set up. And then you have to start looking at what happened with this assessment. What are the patterns that I see? Who did well, who struggled? And if they struggled in specific, what did they struggle on? And uh, as that screen we showed you earlier, uh, tracking the students understanding, if we can narrow our focus down to maybe it was one single thing that they didn't get, 
one of those I can statements just we didn't get it across to them or was it everything that we taught? So we need to know that uh, as we go through our own classes, we get all that done, we get everything graded. And in our case, we record everything in our spreadsheets. And then we have that high, medium, low examples, who did really well, who did very poorly, who's in between. So that when we come back to our PLC the next week, and I say the next week because you, you can't wait to do this, you've gotta, you've gotta move on. We discuss this. How did our students do? Who did better than others? Why did they do better? Uh, you know, and I guess everybody teaches multiple classes of kids. Did we approach the the, learn, the teaching one way with say our morning class, and we did it something different in the afternoon class? You know, what can we learn from our own selves and how we taught? And then we need to look across the entire grade level and see. Uh, for example, if Ms. Franklin's class did really well on it and my class did poorly, how did she approach teaching it? Did she do something that I didn't do so that we can learn what we need to do to go back and reteach our kids? But also it goes to how are we going to do that inter intervention that we talked about earlier and then we'll get a whole lot more into after a while. Do we need to split these kids up? If there's something that I can't get across these kids, does another teacher need to address that topic with them? So how are we going to adjust our teaching moving forward? What do we do for those who are really falling behind who just didn't get it? And then the part that, and as a school, I think we need to work on even more. I know we do in our grade level. What are we gonna do for the ones who've got it and who are ready to move on? We're always wanting to work on the low kids and get them up to where we think they should be. But we've got these kids who are just blowing it away what are we going to do for them? And uh, it was a whole lot easier two years ago, last year with COVID, everything was, as you all know, we've all said over and over, really messed up. But two years ago, we would move kids around from class to class so that we, we could actually do the instruction that they needed at the level they were at. Would you mind going to the next screen, Sarah? There you go. Thank you. Okay. And, you know, we call them summative assessments. We call them formative assessments, I guess, because when we give them, in my mind, my way of thinking, they're all formative assessments because they're all guiding us into what we're going to do next. Uh, but both for summative and formative, you know, assess learning. They're both used for feedback and they're both used for future planning. Uh, formative assessments, and I know I used to struggle with this, how, how much do you have to do? Well, that can be a simple question that you ask. You know, ask a child if you're talking about the area of a rectangle, can you tell me how to find the area of a rectangle? And if they can tell you, take the length and width and multiply them together and that gives you the area, they got it. And you've done a very quick, you've done a very quick uh, assessment to see are they on track with where you want to be? Or just the observation, the classwork, the homework, if you do homework, uh, and simple, a check mark, you know, if you have their a list of names you carry around with you that you walk by and see, yes, they're doing what you need them to do, give a check mark, you know they're on track for where you need to be. The, uh, the, the thing we have to keep in mind, and you all know by now, and I know everybody here does, we're ending our ACT test after this year. But we know the state's coming up with some other form of standardized testing that we're going to end up doing. So we have to keep preparing our kids for that. So we have to plan that assess our assessments so that our assessments are rigorous enough and hopefully more rigorous than what the ACT is so that we can have our kids ready to go when it comes time to take that AC, ACT assessment, assessment or whatever it's going or whatever the new assessment is going to be. My main, my main thing about assessments is, you know, do them in, in the, at the right time. I know when I was in school, of course, that was, you know, that was prehistory time when I was in school. Seems like we went forever and then all of a sudden the teacher said, tomorrow you're having a test. Well, we know better now that we shouldn't go more than three weeks in a cycle to give an assessment, 15 days of, of teaching. And we need to limit the number of things that we want them to know on a given assessment. 
Uh, Ms. Stobel, if I could get you to go to the sample math test, I'd like to bring that up and show them a little bit what I'm talking about there. No, no, not the unit plan. There's a, there's just an actual assessment. I'm sorry. Maybe it's on the next, a slide or two down. I'm not sure. That is it. Okay. So on this, uh, on this assessment, and this is an, this is something that, that, that we have just, just for purposes of showing you what to do. The first thing we have is these I can statements. So we have this learning snapshot. This is the, what the kids would see. That's the first page on their test. And they know I need to solve real world or world word problems using division of fractions. And they also know how many problems they're gonna get. They're gonna get three problems. Uh, they can compute a quotient of a fraction. They're gonna have three problems on that. Three problems on modeling division of a fraction. And if you'll slide down just a little bit on that screen, here's one other thing that I think is kind of important. Give them some sort of motivation. Guess what? You can do this. You've been through the teaching. We have shown you how to do this. We've worked enough problems. You've worked enough problems. You got this. So now we're gonna take this assessment, then we're gonna move on. Okay, so just some sort of an inspirational quote. All right, and then you get into the actual assessment. Now, at the top of the, first page, it told you actually what this, what was being, a, what was being assessed, that is division of fractions. So you give them the assessment and you can scroll on through here. These are just some sample problems. You'll notice these are all multiple choice problems. That's okay because we know in math, you have to show your work anyway when there's work to be shown. And when you get down here to the word problems, it even tells you to show your work, has a place for them to put their answer. So they've worked through this entire assessment. I think there's nine problems on this one. Then you get down to the next screen. Now the next screen, we have an answer key. And on the answer key, you with your PLC team have decided, you know, if it's not just a straight multiple choice answer, if they have to make some sort of a computation, what are you going to accept as the correct answer? Uh, take question number eight, for instance, the answer is seven and one half. Would you accept seven and two fourths? Would you accept 7.5? So all the possible answers that you're going to accept because we need to make sure that every class is being graded the same way. So I don't want to accept something that no one else would accept. That gets really important when you're getting them into some sort of a justification that they're trying to write out. How much do they have to give you in order to justify an answer? And then at the bottom, we have the proficiency guide. And on this one, uh, nine questions, we put down if they got eight or nine of them correct, they're ready to go, we can move on. And uh, we always like to give them the benefit of missing one question because everybody gets something wrong all the time, it seems like. If they got seven of them correct, then they're close. We still got a little bit more work to do, but if they got six or less, hey, they're not ready. They're in the need of a lot of support. And if a lot of your students are down there in that need of support, that's telling you, I got to slow this down. I've got to teach this better. They're not ready for a summative assessment anytime soon. Now, also on this, uh, I lost my train of thought there for a second. Yeah, whatever it was, I, I, I forgot. I was going to add one more thing to it. But anyway, that's, that's the assessment. It's just making sure that the assessment is in line with what it is you originally intended to teach the kids in that unit of study, or in this case, uh, you know, or on division of fractions, did they get everything assessed that we intended for them to know so that we can check that standard off saying, hey, my kids got that, we're ready to move on to the next thing. And then you have a sample literacy assessment as well, and Jesse might go into more on that, but uh, it's basically designed the same, the same way. I don't think we have the cover sheet on this one. And on this case, they have us, they have an article to read. No, I remember this. I taught literacy last year too. So yeah, I remember this. And then a multiple choice questions for the most part, then you get down here in question eight and they're having to write out their, an, their answers. But again, the same thing goes as a PLC, you need to decide what's going to be an acceptable answer in order to know that they have got what you're trying to get them to do out of this assessment. And the, the key is, and I don't look for perfection because everybody makes mistakes, 
but are, are they getting enough of the information? Can we show if a parent asks or if one of our administrators says, can you show me that the kids got this, that we have the documentation to say, hey, they got this, they're ready to move on. That's about all I have, Ms. Stoball. Thank you. Um, I want to I want to bring up just a few things that I think are super important. Um, we worked really hard when we designed our assessments. I, I think sometimes we give assessments, and we may even in the formatting of them, may we may be making it difficult on ourselves to even know how to use the data. I mean, you even think about having a multiple page assessment that you're flipping back and forth and you're trying to figure out I've got these I can statements but what is it that the students actually where do I need to intervene something as simple as what Steve just showed you guys of putting the learning targets on the first page boy that's a great guide for you to know right away how do I need to divide up my students for intervention and I'm getting ready to talk about intervention in just a second um, but I want to switch gears. Uh, Ms. Lobo, I do. I do want to share one more thing. Of course. I remember what it was. <laughs> See, I'm old. I forget. I lose my train of thought. Oftentimes we grade and we and, and we say things like, "Well, you missed three out of nine. That's very negative. And the better way to say that is, "Well, you got six out of nine. You're you're getting there. You're getting close." You know, you can do most of this. So we just got a little bit more work to do. So I like the idea of telling them how many they got correct. And even when I grade up a, a homework paper, instead of marking at the bottom minus two because they missed two, mark plus six because they got six right. And we don't, it's not how much they got wrong. It's how much did they get right that's important. How, how much have they learned? I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. That's no don't say you're sorry. That's great. Uh, Candace, I saw your reaction whenever he said something about ACT Aspire. Um, it was shared. It was shared with us in a, and we don't have any sort of insights. Mr. Principal, I'm master, sorry. My principal said that it was shared with him in the master principal last time. Oh, okay. Well, we heard it just in a recent math training that they were going to look at a different, um, look at a different testing company. Possibly, I'm not sure. Just. We're not getting away from uh, state testing. It's just that they're going to look for a, a different testing source, I'm assuming. Um, so anyway, back with this. When we first started the process to look at assessments, um, and, and keep in mind that we had um, one of our focuses for the year was it was on assessments. We've done a lot of work around it. Something that Steve just said, I think is super, super important that we don't think about enough with assessments when he said that they had marked off minus three. We spent, instead of saying you got six of them right. I think if we went around the room and every one of us, um, and I talked about this a little bit yesterday, if we went around the room, our virtual room, I guess, and talked about what emotion is triggered by assessments, I think most of us would probably say nervous. Um, because that's almost what we were trained to be. We were almost trained to be nervous, like it's test day and oh my gosh, and it doesn't matter how much you studied for it, you were nervous. And we don't really think about the idea of we work so hard every day, you know, six, seven hours a day, we are working really, really hard to instill this hope. Um, encourage our students, we are their biggest cheerleaders, and then we put an assessment in front of them, and they shut down on us. And it's almost like we've accepted that that should be the norm. So we spent some time thinking about how can we use our assessment practices to really instill hope. So just something as simple as putting your learning targets on the very first page. You are, you're letting your students know what is it that you are, what can they expect on this test? Um, they also are teachers, just that simple, yes, you can do that, just that motivator. Before they ever even see the first page, you're encouraging them. We also have to think about the type of feedback that we're giving our students um, in order to encourage them, because what is the purpose of feedback? Feedback, in my opinion, when it comes to assessments, is far more important than the grade that you put on there. If you look at any sort of research, just putting a grade on the work 
no matter how clear the grade is, if you just put a 100, it does not encourage learning. Feedback encourages learning. Grades have no impact on student learning. Um, it, it's just, yes, okay, I got everything right, but let's say it's a writing piece and you put 100%, you're not telling the student what they, what they actually did right that you want to see them continue. So feedback is a huge piece of that. But something as simple as just putting your learning targets on the first page or thinking about how you lay out your test. Steve also said that a student got a six out of nine. Well, what if there are multiple targets on that assessment? Six out of nine does not help us know where we need to go intervene with that student. So putting your targets on the first page like this, you can see exactly where you need to go work. Um, if y'all will bear with me, for just a hot minute, I'm going to go, uh, actually, let me go over here. Y'all can see all my junk mail that I have not answered yet, or other mail. There's probably something really important in there that I, can't get to because of all the other stuff. Um, well, I was looking for, anyway, I can just talk through it real fast. Um, it's the quickest way to get through your data is just it's pile stack plan. If you have an assessment, um, if you have an assessment that has this right here at the top of it, and like Steve said, you can't wait several days to intervene. We have, and we're going to talk about, I'm, I'm spending a little bit more time on this because we're about to go into response to intervention next, and clearly assessments is the first step of deciding your intervention groups. Pile stack plan is um, a strategy that we use where if you have a target right here, the very first one, I can solve uh, word problems using division of fractions. They can quickly look at that target, see how many one out of three goes in one stack together, two out of three can go in another stack, three out of three goes in another stack. They're gonna do this all together. It takes two seconds. So then they'll decide who taught that skill um, pretty well, like they're going to agree on that because we've just got a good culture and they'll do that. Who did that the best? Okay, you're going to take the lowest students because you want your best teacher with your lowest students. There's my win group. Who's the close group that I can take them? And maybe there's just one little common error that we see and I'm going to fix, I'm going to fix them. I'm going to work with that one. Who is three out of three, like Steve said, that they've got it. But we need to extend them because during win time, win time for us stands for whatever I need. We're not just talking about intervention. We're talking about extension. So to set up your assessment in a way that you have this on the first page is really not only for the kiddos, it's for you too. Because we don't have time in our day to sift through and decide what was this problem about? What was this about? So you set up your assessment where you can, it works best for you that you can divide it up. One more thing I want to talk about when it comes to assessment, and we're going to talk a little bit more in data next. Um, we, whenever we were going through a, some assessment training, we had a really, really good conversation about how we were given the assessments. I wish I would have included this, but I didn't <clears throat> because I had another example of a test where they have exactly how they're going to administer the test. Think about this for just one second. <clears throat> I teach sixth grade literacy. Okay, so let's go back and look at this. Not there. Let's go back and look at this literacy test. I'm going to speak on literacy because that's what I um, that's what I know the best. So we have this test, and I give the test to the students. I read the directions. I know I've got some struggling readers in there, so I'm going to start reading the selection to them, okay? Then as they start to take the assessment, um, I have a student raise their hand and they say, I don't know what exposition means. What do I do here? So I stop because, you know, I'm going to be helpful and I start guiding them through this first question. I start giving them clues through this first question. Well, Jesse is teaching right next door to me. Jesse doesn't do any of those things. She's told her students, this is for me to be able to see what you know, 
you do the best, she hands the assessment to them. Are we gonna have the same kind of data? We're not. I read to my students when I'm testing them on reading. That's not good data. It's not good data at all. I am trying to help them through what is exposition. That's what they're tested over. So we had to back up and make sure that we were even giving the test the same way. And you know, we may start out the school year where we are gonna read those directions. We are gonna give them a few clues. We are gonna get them started. And then we're gonna scaffold that because if we truly need to trust our data, I'm hurting my students if I'm giving them too many clues throughout the assessment because my data is, I can no longer trust it. I'm gonna think that my students really, really have this and then interim test rolls around and they bombed it. Why have they bombed it on the interim? Because we can't tell them anything on the interim. What if I never conditioned our students to take a test on their own? And I'm sure if you would stop and reflect, no, we've done that by thinking that we're being helpful for our students. We have given them too much information when it comes to the assessment. So you've got to really, really back up and say, if I believe like Steve just told me, a formative set assessment is just to inform us of where to go. Don't be afraid of backing off and letting your students struggle through those assessments. Don't be afraid of that. Trust your data and then intervene from there. We are handhold, we were handholding way too much because again, there are babies. We are teaching them. This is what we're doing. It's hard to watch a kid sit there with some puppy dog eyes and struggle in your classroom. So you try to help them. So, but what are we doing whenever it comes to that assessment? at the end of the year and they're raising their hand because they've been able to all year long and ask you what exposition means. And that's the very first time that you say to them, sorry, I can't help you. And I know it's not all about the state assessment, but why are we not going to give them every opportunity to do their best so then we can trust that data as well. Um, so sure, we- I was gonna say, oh. Go ahead. Uh, I did say, I strike a nerve I with you? I have got something to say. Sorry, Steve and I are both volumes on. Go ahead. Um, I have an example that has our delivery instructions on it. Okay. I don't know if you would. I'm going to hit stop share and you can share it right now. Maybe. Okay. I think she gave y'all sharing rights. Can you see my screen? Um, yes. Okay. So this is more, this is still the same layout where it has all of our learning targets on it and then the and then the learning snapshot. Oh, you're not muted. Are we still echoing? No, I'm muted, Steve. You're fine. Okay. So then we have where down like where our answer key is. We also have delivery instructions so that every single person is giving the test the same way. So um, pass out assessment, uh, remind students not to begin on it until they're instructed. Once everyone has it, ask them to write their name. And then it even goes down to do not read aloud unless stated in the IEP, ELL, or 504. So, but this just, we typically, these are on our um, answer keys as well with our rubric. Just so Sarah was saying that we're not giving any help to students to get like a true representation of what the data is. And, and we did not, when we got further and further into our data, um, that is when we realized and just had those discussions around how are you giving that assessment. And that may seem um, like, come on, that's a little extreme, but it's not a little extreme because whenever you start to have those conversations, you will realize that you are not giving that to them the same way. We even um, talk about as we get closer to the uh, time of the test, have we created a test that is really encouraging stamina and grit in our students? A lot of our tests don't take the same amount of time. So we're giving them assessments that may take five, 10 minutes, and then they've got to sit still for an extended period of time and read multiple selections. So we scaffold that process as the year goes on in order to prepare our students. Again, we're not building everything around that state assessment. I get, I hate when people say it's not all about the test. It certainly is not all about the test, 
but why would you not give your students every opportunity to do their best? And also as they progress through their school career, not all of their tests are gonna be five or 10 minutes. We've got to be able to make sure that they have, like I said, that stamina and that grit to uh, read multiple selections at a time and know what it is that's expected of them. Um, Ms. Stobal, before you move on, I want to go no, back go right to ahead. what we both mentioned, but I want to reiterate it because it is so vitally important. We do all the testing, we get the results, and we see that uh, one of the skills that they didn't get, like I can solve word problems involving fractions. If we know that's the only target they're missing, then that tells us, okay, now we need to go in. Is it a language barrier? Can they just not understand what the words were saying? Or is it a math problem? And then to know that we can go down and look at the, what we call the naked math problems. If they could solve those, but they couldn't solve the word problems, it may not even be anything we need help with. We might need to go talk to our literacy instructors, say, hey, what kind of support can I give them to help them get through the, the understanding of this problem? So having those cover sheets, it serves a whole lot of functions for us as teachers and makes our, it seems like it's more work to do up front, but in the long run, it's making our lives a whole lot easier having it done so that we can refer to it. And one other thing, when we're going back and reteaching, we we've, we've got to get back to that idea of we're all here to teach the kids and it doesn't matter which kids it is. If another teacher can reach them better on a certain skill, I gotta be willing to say, you know what? You're better at that than I am. I want my kids to learn. I'm willing to let you do that and not take it personal that, hey, I couldn't teach that to them. We can't teach everybody everything. Uh, some people are better at things than other people are. Oh, Steve. Steve, you've had to teach all the subjects. You're good at all of it. <laughs> Can I jump in real quick as well? Yeah. Um, so in looking at the literacy, um, we decided in my co-taught sixth grade class when talking about climax and exposition and resolution that their LPAC does say that they need things read to them, but the reality is on the ACT Aspire is that they don't get the reading test read to them. Um, and that's overwhelming and daunting because we chunk and break down and try to make it accessible to them throughout the school year when it's not made that way on the test for them. And as frustrating as that is, um, we do have to expose them to that throughout the year because that's what they're gonna see at the end. So we decided for us that um, the, the few words we wanted them to focus on climax and resolution apply to things they're gonna continue to learn and the grades ahead of them. Those were the two main vocabulary words. And we found a, um, reading a, a level text that was on their reading level for them. So we found a second grade text or a third grade text and applied climax and resolution and some of those target vocabulary words that we wanted them to find on a, um, on a, on a, a reading level test that they could understand basically. And we did not read that one out loud to them. We expected them to read that through that themselves and it was the, it were that they were the same types of questions that the native speakers were getting, um, but on a text level that they could read and understand themselves. Um, and we progress that as the year goes on. We give them a third grade level text, a fourth until they are up towards the end of the year with a grade level text because they're not going to get that at the end of the year on their on their state standardized test. Um, but for us, uh, we decided that it was more important for them to know the vocabulary and context of the vocabulary with a text they could understand. Um, versus throwing them a sixth grade level text um, and basically watching them drown, it seemed like, um, because they couldn't get past the page full of words. First of all, they saw the page full of words and just immediately shut down. Um, and then they saw the questions, you know, the five or six questions full of words and immediately shut down again. So, and that's different for every district and what your district wants and prioritizes. But for us, it was about the the few vocabulary words and making it accessible for them at the time and then scaffolding as we went later on. And sometimes that's hard um, if we don't make it clear even to our parents that while we will we will read the test to them during you know the instruction and things like that because that's what we're supposed to do um, but but 
sometimes that's also really hard because you they they oh they've got it read to them and then if we don't make it clear whenever they get on this test at the end of the year it cannot read to them um we had some we had some tears over that because the parents didn't necessarily realize that that was you know um what was expected on the end of course testing okay i was going to share one more thing candace did you have something okay you're muted i wanted to talk about what reed just said i know she serves a different group of students because the, the need is higher in her school district but at my school district, we um, serve a large population of students, um, a larger than some that I've looked at, uh, students with characteristics of dyslexia. And that was part of our PLC that we've done this year was um, 504s, putting that read aloud feature on some, or accommodation on some of the students who might not need it. And that's how I realized and I learned and I grew this year as a reading specialist and dyslexia therapist is while I was identifying my students at the end of the year that were new to the district or for whatever reason had not been identified at our level yet, and that still happens at the high school level, is that their listening comprehension on their dyslexia profile, pulling those in when we're accommodating for students and looking at students who have characteristics of dyslexia and that need that test re read aloud to them, looking at that and saying, if their listening comprehension was one of their weak points, is it really going to help that student? Is it going to be in their benefit to read that test aloud? Some may have excellent listening comprehension, but their decoding skills is, that would be a, a student who would need their test read aloud. So going back through those 504s is a part of what we're working on and making sure that we're not over Bombarding, you know, bombarding ourselves with things that we shouldn't be doing for students who really don't need that. Thank you. Yes, and a lot of our kids have come to expect things to be read to them when we're giving them assessments or we hand them something and they just kind of stare at us like, okay, are you going to start? Or are you going to go? And I mean, a lot of that is what we've what we've done. We've conditioned them to do. I um, mean, we tell them we're going to read aloud, or we pull small groups and do read alouds. Um, but chunking the text and then finding grade level text that was a, that were appropriate for them really helped create some independence for our kids. We saw this year um, by getting away from the sixth grade level text and incorporating some of the lower level text in that they were successful with without us having to read to them. Um, and they didn't know that they were second grade level text or, you know, whatever it was. Um, but as they saw success with the grade level texts that were more appropriate for them, and then we continue to add on to that, they gained some independence away from always saying, are you going to read this to me or, or waiting for us basically to start. Um, and that wasn't for all of our kids, but we did see some of that this year um, since we weren't able to mixed groups with other classes and we were kind of stuck in our own class this year is something we really really focused on and we also used instead of the paper forms we used google uh, surveys the google surveys for our classroom based assessments to go on there and say our you know instead of filling that out on a paper we have that now digitally we're tracking that digitally to say who is refusing accommodation so that we can clean those up mm -hmm. that's a good idea I think um, I think what you just said is a lot of what we ran into, especially when we are um, accepting and reviewing 504s and IEPs from a previous school. Um, and it's so important. And this year, um, at the end of the year, we our 504 and IEP meetings um, took a lot longer than they usually do. But I think that it was important because of everything that you just said, while they've had this accommodation or modification this entire time, we want to be able to see what they, um, we don't want to hinder them. If there's something that we can take away um, or you know whatever it may be in order to prepare them to be able to read more of the text, we're gonna give, those, give them those skills. I think that that's super important. But that's just a good time because you've got your parents and a captive audience with you to really explain that. And we all know if you're a good teacher and it's not on there, you're still going to do what a student needs. And then if you have to get back together and say, 
All right, we jumped the gun on this. They do need this a little bit longer and we're gonna put it back on their plan. Let's do that and then let's try it again. I think that that's important and I think that you should do that. But um, sometimes we go through the motions of the plan and we don't really stop and look at the data that we've collected to see what is that student capable of doing and what they needed in first grade may not be what they still need with us here in fifth grade. So thank you, those are excellent points. One more thing on assessments before we move over um, and I talk about RTI is um, another thing that we were doing that we had to stop doing was if we were testing on, let's say, summarizing a text, you better believe most of all of our questions had the word summarize in it. Well, if you've ever looked at any of the released items or if you've ever you know, reviewed anything, um, how often did the ACT Aspire actually put the word summarize in there if that was the skill or the standard? They don't. And so our students would sometimes come up to a question and go, I don't know what they're wanting me to do. Or we would even review a question after an interim and go, what was it that they were testing on this one? Oh, okay, now I see it. So we were also making our questions a little, we we're spoon feeding them a little bit too much. If it was a standard on inference, our question had the word inference in it. In it. If it was a standard on summarizing, it had it in there. If it was about the theme, it said theme. So I encourage you when you review your assessments to go back and look at different ways to word that. So this question right here, which of the following statements best describe the main idea of the text? If they can get to the main idea of the text, they have to be able to summarize it before they can get to the main idea. We don't have to say summarize the text for them to summarize the text. So does that make sense? So look at how you're wording your questions and and C, push your students to that higher level so they know when I see a question like this, I've got to be able to summarize it if I'm going to determine that the main idea is that money doesn't buy happiness. They cannot come to that conclusion unless they know how to summarize. So we, and I'm speaking for us ourselves, we were putting too much, too many clues in the question. So that is something that we um, are going back even now and looking at how we are wording those questions because we may have our data and it may say that 90% of our students have this standard memorized, but then the ACT Aspire interim test, which is really important to look at that data because that's an outside source to really compare how you're doing your work or how well you're teaching and how well your students are learning. When we would look at that, we would think, gosh, they bombed that question. What in the world? We've taught this. I know they have it. It could just be in how you are asking that question. So think about that whenever you are wording your questions. Get the most bang for your buck and how you can word it and reach a higher DOK level. Um, let me stop share for just a second and then we'll get back over to the other, um, other PowerPoint. Um, okay, so really, really great discussion on um, assessments. And I could probably, we could probably go on and on about that. Um, let me get back. I'm so sorry. I'm not a very good facilitator right now, but I've got, oh, I don't know, probably 15 tabs open and suddenly my computer doesn't want to work. 